Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. If you could all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Doreen, would you please do the roll call? Nicholas McGee. Here. Rachel Henriksen. Here. Roger B. Lee. Here. Robin Saunders. Here. Rick Duperry. Absent. Jennifer Ladd. Here. And Rick Mankin. Here. Thank you very much. Uh, the May 20th, 2019 minutes were distributed. I don't know if everyone had a chance to review them. Um, and we'd like to make a motion to approve those. Um, I would say so moved. Oh, so moved. There's my green button. Sorry. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Should that to be unanimous. Thank you. All right. Little housekeeping. Items number five and item number 12 have been tabled this evening. So our first property on the agenda is number six. F9 Properties LLC requests a site plan review. For 374 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 45. And I will just, uh, before I kick it over to Jamel, just make a note that we do have a very heavy agenda this evening. So we're going to ask all of our applicants and presenters to please just say to the, uh, the major topics uh, that you would have seen through staff comments. And of course, point out any other items in staff comments that you uh, may disagree with or need some clarity around. And hopefully we'll be able to get through those. Thank you. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> so this project's located in the B3 zoning district along Route 1, um, and a portion of the site's also located in the Stream Protection Overlay District. So the, so the applicant's proposing to renovate the existing building on the property and construct a 728-square-foot accessory storage building for the proposed retail use. Uh, staff is generally comfortable with the materials, but would like to point out that the applicant has placed a temporary sales trailer within the parking area on the site. The board should note that the applicant is required to receive approval uh, for the, this use on the site. A subsequent site plan amendment application will need to be submitted to the board in order for the sales trailer to be occupied. And the codes department has also communicated this to the applicant. Uh, but staff has provided the board with a draft motion with conditions for your consideration this evening. That's it. Thank you, Jamal. Go ahead and please introduce the project. Sure. Uh, Steve Blake with BH2M representing F9 Properties. Um, just a few of the changes that we made to the project since the last time uh, we were in front of the board. Uh, the, the, the curb opening has been reduced. It was about 42 feet. We've reduced that to 30 feet uh, to conform to the, re the requirements. Uh, the, also, the storage building size has been reduced to 26 by 28. It was 30 by 32. The reason for that was uh, to reduce the number of parking spaces required for the parcel. So there's 16 uh, that are, are proposed and 16 that are required. <coughs> uh, we've also made some revisions to the front landscape buffer and added a few deciduous trees, uh, red, red maples. Uh, and we've added a uh, proprietary stormwater treatment system, um, a focal point to capture uh, the, the bulk of the large parking area for, for some treatment. Um, one other item is we are we're requesting a waiver to reduce the drive aisle width um, down from 25 to 24 feet. Um, and then with the for the temporary sales trailer, I spoke with the applicant before the meeting tonight, um, and they are, are preparing to remove the trailer. Um, <coughs> they're preparing to remove it. They would like to come back at some point um, with a site plan amendment so that they could have that on site during construction. Uh, the timing of that I'm not quite sure of yet. I don't know when, the constru when construction will start. Um, they just ask that we um, just run this by staff and the board to see if it was a possibility to leave it there temporarily um, unoccupied, so not, not being used. Um, so I guess if there's any uh, consideration for that, it would be appreciated. But that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone here from the public that would like to comment on this project? If you would, please step to the podium, state your name. Seeing that, I'm going to close public comment. I'm going to turn this over to the board. Um, really do want to stick to uh, kind of the main points 
um, and I'll jump in right now. So the, the trailer, um, I mean, I think, I think you've put us in a tough spot here. Either, either it's agreed to get moved or it's part of this, this plan. Um, you know, and, and it seems like you've done all the engineering, gotten everything else that we've asked for, and this seems to be a bit of a sticking point. Yeah, and I mean, we're, you know, the applicant is obviously willing to remove the trailer, so. Can we have, have a time frame associated with it before this board takes any formal action? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I would assume that if, you know, they're, they're offering to remove it, I would assume it would be soon. I don't have a specific time frame. Um, How's one week sound? A week? Keenan is here from Cabinets to Go. He's nodding his head, so I guess we'll go with that. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, uh, as far as just from my two cents here for the board members, uh, I'm okay with the waiver request from 25 to 24. Um, doesn't pose an issue with me. Glad to see we made the made the parking work. Um, I know that was a challenge, so um, I don't have much else. Uh, does any do any of my other board members have something they'd like to? The question the applicant on? Sure. Rachel. Yeah. Um, I know part of the staff comments address the issues of the architecture and signage. And it does note that uh, the applicant had permission to remove the front porch. What that did was remove the front door. And now the applicant is proposing that the side door, what used to be the side door, becomes the front door. And as a front door, it needs to meet certain architectural standards. And under the, um, under the design standards of architecture slash six, there is a list of 10 uh, elements of which three must be part of the uh, architecture to create a visually pleasing uh, appearance from the street you know, for a, a front door. Um, I think what I need is to see what that new design is for what is now a new front door on the side of the building. Scarborough has a preference for a front door that actually would face Route 1, but we have agreed in the past uh, to have, for varying reasons, a front door, a front facade that is to the side as you're proposing. But there are certain design standards, and as the staff noticed, noted, the applicant will need to provide updated building elevations, floor plans, an outdoor outside access plan, uh, and I think a visual of what the facade, what this new facade is going to look like. And I have no problem with the, uh, the waiver. Is there anything else, Rachel? Rachel, are you, are you all set? Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else on the board that would like to weigh in? Yes, Rick. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out that little bump out on that proposed garage as you're facing uh, the garage from Route 1. Is that a door? Yeah, it's a man door with a covered entry. I think you're going to have to put a light on that door, aren't you? Um, I... Your, your lighting plan indicates you're going to put five lights. One's by the overhead on that one side, but the door... And looking at your photo metrics there, if you're going to park over there, you're going to be in pretty, pretty much darkness during a winter night. Not sure what your hours of operation are going to be, but I would think a light on that would give a little light in the parking lot during the dark hours. Yep. Um, it's something that we can look at. Um, I think the concern was putting a light there gets you closer to that. Um, westerly property line, um, but we, we can look at the photometrics. All right, that, that's all I had. Uh, sure, and can I just have um, just some feedback from the board based on the conditions that are in this draft, um, whether you feel like the elevation um, question itself is, is addressed adequately under the conditions section, and then Rick was speaking towards uh, the lighting. Um, how do you feel? You know, feel comfortable enough that um, the parking lot lights maybe that that language could be modified to just say lighting. You know, 
lighting is reviewed or something. Yeah, and leave it up to staff to to uh, ensure that it's in code compliance and and that you know the the real dark spots is where I'm I'm seeing where there's a chance of a slip and fall or something like that being in total darkness. So I'll leave it up to staff at that point. Thank you. Yeah. Jen Roger, you guys all set? All right. Uh, with, with that, we do have a motion prepared this evening, which will be ready in one second. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jamal. All right. I move to approve the site plan amendment project titled Cabinets to Go, proposed by F9 Properties LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by BH2M, dated 52419, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to renovate the existing structure on the property and construct a 728 square foot accessory storage building with associated parking, landscaping, and utilities. The property is located in the general business B3 zoning district. There is also a portion of the property located in the stream protection overlay zoning district. Property is identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map U39, lot 45, 374 U.S. Route 1. The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, interna internal vehicular movement, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers. One, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 24 feet. Conditions, one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, snow storage areas on the site plan. B, a plan note indicating when the parking lot lights shall be dimmed as discussed with planning board. C, updated building elevations, floor plans, and outside access plan of the proposed accessory storage building. D, an updated landscape plan that includes the size of the accessory storage building. E, an updated landscaping plan that includes the lo new location of the project sign. F, additional light on the site, fi uh, the additional fixtures. light fixtures on the site as discussed with the planning board. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, submit the approved M main DEP permit by rule application. C, pay the in-lieu fee in the amount equal to the estimated construction of a sidewalk along the Highgis Parkway frontage. Oh, sorry. Route 1 frontage. Thank you. Strike that, please. Route 1 frontage. The funds are to be directed to the town's multimodal reserve account. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of sign permit, the applicant shall submit a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, the temporary sales trailer shall be removed on the site by 6-17-19. And then prior to the start of the construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the full motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Yes, Rachel. Yeah, I, I have a question on 1C, We you say the updated building elevations, floor plans, and an outside access plan of the proposed accessory storage building. Um, the English teacher in me says all of those clauses refer to the accessory storage building. And I was talking about um, updated elevations and floor plans and the front facade for the main building, as well as the storage building. Um, if, if the intent is that this means the main building as well as the storage building, I think a little clarity in the conditions to, say, to state that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the facades and elevations were included with past submissions for the main building with the porch removed. Um, I believe while that is possible that the... Um, the change of the facade from a front entrance to a side entrance. At this point, uh, I cannot recall whether the uh, design standards were met with that change. The discussion was around the removal of the porch, but not necessarily making the side entrance the main entrance, which does meet a different, request a certain design standard in, in, the, uh, in the ordinances. Okay. 
I'd ask if you yeah. could add the renovated building to so unupdated. So you're making a motion to amend the language to state updated billet, building elevations, floor plans, and an outside access plan of the proposed accessory storage building and the renovated building. That, uh, that, that works. I, I think I'm fine on the outside access plan for the, the main building, but if we, they're going to do um, updated uh, building elevations for both, and that's included, but that's fine. Shouldn't that wording be after floor plans? What, what Rachel wants to add. Building elevations, floor plans. If it would help, my major concern is the the front facade as it faces Route One, which is now not the main entrance of the building, and the side facade, which has become the main entrance of the building because of the removal of the front porch. So that's what um, the design standards do call for some uh, care to be taken so that it, from the road there's a pleasing facade. And I think in the original plans, the front elevation was actually the front facade of the building. And then when the front porch was removed, <coughs> that then moved the front entrance to the, to the side. And I'm not clear that that was reflected in the original plans. So um, I would assume that the floor plans have not really changed. Um, okay, so I think but, we've got a solution here. Okay. So C would remain as it stated. We would add a condition G, which would state that the updated building elevations of the renovated building on the site so we're asking for updated elevations for the, for the renovated. That's fine. That, so that is a, a motion, Rachel? Yes, so moved. Second. Second. I have a second. Uh, so I have a motion and a second. All in favor of the amendment to the motion. Okay. So we're going to vote on the motion as amended. Uh, all in favor. So that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Lot 4A. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This project's located in the Business Office Research, or BOR, uh, zoning district at 80 Campus Drive. And the applicant was last before the board uh, for this project in April. So as a reminder, the applicant's proposing to construct a 108,000 square foot three-story medical building on their existing campus, um, in addition to 500 new parking spaces. As requested uh, by the board, the applicant has provided materials outlining a portion of the existing parking on the campus with ratios of utilization and times of day. The materials include information for why an 85% utilization is desired uh, by the applicant. Staff would like to note that it appears that the applicant did not include uh, the existing parking area closest to the Route 1 Hillcrest Avenue intersection with the materials. Uh, and recommends that the applicant, that the board and the applicant have a discussion about the proposed parking spaces for the project, and if any reduction in impervious area is a possibility given the desired utilization rate on the site. Uh, staff is also recommending that the applicant provide an additional sidewalk on the site to provide for a better connection to the large parking lot along the property's easterly border. And uh, staff was made aware that the DEP permit uh, is on a revised time frame, um, so the applicant should be should update the board on that permit. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Jamal. <coughs> Would you like to introduce yourself in the, uh, in the main topic section? Yes, thanks. Steve Kasabian. I'm Chief Administrative Officer at Maine Medical Partners. Thank you for allocating some time this evening. I'll be brief with my comments. Rob and others uh, who will follow will share details with you. Um, Let's see here. We'll go the right way. Um, 
so just to refresh everyone's memory, <clears throat> last time we were here, we shared with you our plans, our initial plans regarding the proposed medical office building on our Scarborough campus, um, reviewed elevations and building information, landscape and stormwater, and then traffic, parking, and circulation uh, were discussed that evening as well. Um, tonight, we want to come back to you after spending more time uh, refining our, our plans for this proposed building, answering questions from uh, folks here on the planning board and from staff, um, have more information to share with you, which we'll do this evening, uh, specifically as it relates to the pedestrian amenities, electronic vehicle accommodations, which we talked about last time, some landscaping modifications, site lighting, parking utilization. So we've covered a, a lot of ground in the couple of months since we were here last. Um, again, just to ground ourselves in this project so uh, we all remember what it is we're, we're building out there and why. This is be a new home for uh, several practices that are spread around our community today or in communities today in five locations bring together in one building neurosciences, neurosurgery, spine care, and neurology. Uh, encompassed in that neuroscience definition, our vascular surgery program that's downtown in Portland right now in 887 Congress, and otolaryngology, the ear, nose, and throat folks who are in a couple of locations in uh, Portland right now. Um, really, the objective in all of this is, uh, is twofold. It's certainly to improve a patient experience. We have our patients traveling around to multiple locations depending on what, um, what their ailments are or what providers are available to see them uh, and traveling, frankly, into some buildings that are very challenging for those folks. So um, this creates an opportunity for us to build a purpose-built uh, facility that brings many of these services together and it allows our physicians and providers to collaborate more than they can today in the disparate locations. So, Rob. Uh, good evening. I'm Robert Corson from uh, SMRT, and I'm going to go through in kind of uh, a, in brevity, try to go through the items that uh, both on the list and then some of the items that we discussed before. Um, similar, similar to Steve, obviously this is a reminder of kind of the exterior of the building and some of the, the major features uh, and the, uh, the uses for the building overview. Uh, for uh, the kind of overall site plan, part of what we discussed last time, <laughs> Ultimately, um, the uh, kind of building in the center is our new building, which is 94, existing uh, research center. We have our um, uh, surgical center. We have 96 campus drive and 100. Uh, so we're, again, continuing on with the proposal of uh, main access uh, additional access point uh, for the 94 campus here, as well as maintaining the existing access to 96 and 94 at that point. Uh, there's another access point, which is along Campus Drive, which is uh, all to the uh, lower parking lot. Uh, one of the things that was asked of us last time was to make sure that that distance between the two met the criteria for the, the distances away, and it does meet the criteria for the uh, distance between the two uh, drive aisles. Um, one of the other major things that we discussed last time really was kind of uh, campus circulation. And so this uh, diagram was uh, one of the requests, I think it was a great idea and it helped us really kind of understand the campus as well. Uh, so what you see here is uh, a, the, the network of uh, pedestrian access that goes uh, from the research center here uh, up through and past the um, surgical center. Uh, this is kind of the what I'll call more of like the uh, meandering path that runs up through here. Right about this point right here is where we will be kind of um, going from the existing pathway and up into our new site, which will basically connect both 96 and 94, as well as the continuation of some of the pedestrian accesses that uh, go up into uh, each of the new parking areas. Uh, this this being kind of one of our major uh, moves within that parking area, both from a vehicular as both a, a pedestrian access point, uh, and then that wraps around and connects up to the uh, parking that's associated with 96. 
There is currently an existing uh, pedestrian connection that connects 96 with 100, and a number of uh, kind of um, uh, legs that go out from the um, pedestrian walkway around 100 that go out into the, each of the parking areas and parking fields. Uh, that is kind of a, one of the th items that we continued out in this area here is to be able to create kind of those fingers that go out into the parking areas and are collectors for each of the pedestrian areas. Uh, one of the requests was, I believe, this is my interpretation, was that uh, the, for a, uh, and if anybody can see that, it, which is the intent of having a walkway across that zone right here, that was one of the requests. Um, we took a look at that as far as uh, what the couple of things we uh, were uh, looking at as far as a value to the owner, as far as um, one is to be able to, uh, in most cases people know that the in a campus atmosphere, most people do not travel in 90 degree, they usually travel in diagonals. Uh, so that that sidewalk probably uh, would not be used as much as I, we think it would. Plus it gives us, uh, this area gives us an opportunity to uh, use it for snow storage and other things along the edge of some of those uh, um, parking areas. Um, kind of just breaking it down into the global to kind of more uh, project related uh, plan. Uh, so this basically is the kind of four quadrants that are kind of illustrated in the plans that you received. Uh, so those kind of uh, break that down with the, the new building uh, 94 here, 96 there. One of the things that's also indicated on this point, and I've noted in your comments, which is the, the uh, access point for the um, uh, treatment area right here, the uh, kind of um, stormwater treatment zone. Uh, so they have access and an easement is being worked out uh, with the um, adjoining part uh, property owners with Main Med. Again, here is uh, again kind of looking at the uh, pedestrian access points that are localized to the site. Uh, again, on this one, it, uh, this being kind of what I'll call the westerly, southwesterly lot, uh, what we tried to do is to highlight the areas we discussed last time. Uh, we have things like the uh, our tables, again for well, and then perpendicular um, pedestrian access points. Uh, stop signs. Uh, this actually was, we added this uh, based upon the comments, which was the idea at the four-way stop is to have an additional uh, stop sign allowing the kind of this uh, kind of top of the page, north-south access point being the primary traffic flow and this being the secondary, kind of the, the uh, east-west being secondary. Uh, highlighted here, we talked about the idea of bringing more of the access accessible parking spaces closer to the building. Uh, so we've uh, included all of these as accessible spaces that are uh, directly adjacent to the building. Uh, we have our uh, added spaces here to the 96 parking lot and, and then a um, additional ones associated with uh, the, the 96 as well. Also indicated on here, we talked about some, again, along the pedestrian uh, access point is uh, places for people to rest and to stop. And, and uh, so we have some benches that have been located along that route. Uh, this being a basically a paved sidewalk and then coming up to what are our uh, port in place sidewalks, which are kind of around most of the main buildings and the main pedestrian circulation. This is the easterly lot, uh, again, uh, indicating on here, um, again, the signage stop signs uh, located at each of these, um, coming out of each of the lots, the signs at the four-way. We have showed the um, a table at this point right here, uh, again, pedestrian crossing point. Uh, we have uh, benches that are associated with the front entry piece. Uh, again, the uh, parking that's associated with uh, the 94, uh, we have our charging stations, which are right at the end of that aisle. And then we have a bike uh, access point at, the, at that point as well. Uh, one of the other th items that was uh, indicated uh, on the plan or on the comments was there is a line that's actually a little, little difficult to see on the landscape plan, which basically kind of illustrates the snow storage portion. 
and that kind of indicates uh, the um, area which is uh, uh, not in conflict with a lot of the, the trees and other landscape material that's uh, around the perimeter at the back side of the lot. Uh, there is a, um, one of the other comments was uh, a guardrail or uh, some sort of um, uh, device or to uh, create some additional safety. My, our, our interpretation was that would be along this edge here. Just wasn't quite sure with the description uh, but that would be a, the, the thought is here, and we've been looking at that as far as making sure that that uh, meets both, both issues is it allows us to continue with the snow storage, uh, gives us safety for that, that side. That's um, you know, it's a two-in-one slope along that, that edge. Uh, the last two sections, which are the lower lot, here's Campus Drive here, access point, again, signage. We've got our uh, tables at this each side of the pedestrian crossing, uh, again, making the perpendicular access point for each of those uh, crossing points along the pathway, accessible parking spaces, uh, again, another bike storage and an access point. Uh, we see that the uh, back side of the building we're programming for a, there's an entry point right at this point right here. So again, we think that it would be a, a a spot there for uh, many of the staff and things like that to uh, enter the building and, and be able to uh, use the uh, bicycle paths and like that to um, either get to work or uh, use it after. Uh, on the upper portion of that, which is actually this area right here, is the surgical center. Uh, so we have on that upper lot, the uh, again, the, some charging stations that are associated with uh, the end of that portion. This is the loading Loading space actually is right here. Uh, and then a, this indicates kind of the existing pedestrian area that comes out of the surgical center and then connects back up to the, the pedestrian walkway that connects the two buildings together. One of the other comments that we have on the, um, uh, the list, which was the, the uh, screening that goes around the loading area, um, there was a, a comment about it being uh, coming a stockade fence versus what's being proposed as a kind of an aluminum uh, louvered screening versus uh, a um, stockade fence type thing. One of the things that uh, from a maintenance and just a general uh, kind of upkeep is that the stockade fence sometimes don't necessarily have the same longevity, don't necessarily uh, um, uh, with the scale that uh, to, you know, provide the screening don't necessarily have the same um, uh, long-term maintenance effect that the uh, that, uh, main med would like to see. Uh, here we have, uh, again, a rendering of the landscape plan. Again, 100 here, 96, 94, surgical center. A couple of the comments that we had, obviously, was I don't think it was as clear uh, on the original one, which is the, the screening that would happen to the easterly side of the, of the lot, uh, again, to both the high and low screening uh, between that and the adjacent uh, parcel. Um, we have some screening that's along the, the, the treatment area uh, here. Again, uh, island plantings, and again, uh, plantings in these areas, again, to accommodate uh, the sidewalks and uh, areas along both those pedestrian access points. Uh, each of these right here is very, uh, uh, more detail that's actually associated with each of this, the uh, breakdown of the plan in the, the package that you have for uh, specific um, lower material that actually happens at each of these garden areas. Uh, here and here, uh, along some of these edge pieces along here. Um, one of the other things that we discussed last time was uh, there was a, a comment about the uh, westerly elevation having to do with uh, some of the uh, potentially not having a window or screening on that side. So we have some landscape and things like that to bring the scale down of the building uh, so that you really do get that uh, idea of the, the three-story being scaled down by the trees and things like that along that edge. That's it. 
Good afternoon. My name is Al Green. I'm Director of Planning at Maine, Maine Health. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, parking utilization, but first, since a theme here, we want to rev uh, remind everybody what we talked about last time. So this is a, re a revised version of a slide we shared last time. Um, and first, I want to say that you know parking demand at a medical facility like this is typically higher than um, the demand you might see at other building types or building uses like a, an office building. Um, generally, what we target at Maine Health is roughly 5.5 spaces per thousand square feet is an ideal um, um, point, and that's about where we are here. And that parking has to be both proximate and available. So we, we target that number of parking per thousand square feet because we want to provide you know, an easy um, or a, a, a reliable source of parking for patients that are showing up and, and to see their uh, physician. And of course, that parking needs to be proximate to the entrance. So one of the things that was requested and we submitted was a parking utilization study of parking that we thought was proximate to uh, the, the proposed building. What you see here is a Google Earth snapshot of the existing site. This is 100 campus here, 96 campus Route 1 is here. The area inside the blue uh, circle or the blue line is what we determined as proximate. The peak parking demand within that area was about 78% on a Tuesday, I think, in the afternoon. The area in yellow was excluded because of that proximate factor. We simply don't think patients or, or staff are going to want to walk or can walk that far to uh, the proposed building, but it is effective for overflow staff parking. So I'll be happy to answer any questions once um, we're finished with the presentation about that, but I uh, wanted to share that. So quickly in closing, um, as we discussed last time, communication is important to us when we're engaging in a project of this scale. Uh, we are, we're constantly communicating with our patients, our staff, other interested parties, and we plan to do the same on this project uh, throughout the medical center and May Medical Partners, the medical group. Um, an example below is just our regular communications regarding the campus replacement and modernization project at May Medical Center. So I certainly would encourage anyone uh, on the board or other interested parties to go on to the website and keep current. Um, we would see the same level of detail for this project as we do for the, for the main project at the Medical Center. Lastly, in terms of anticipated timeline, tonight we find ourselves here in, uh, at the Red Arrow uh, in process, um, still anticipating a State of Maine DEP review to be completed sometime in the order of the end of July. Um, and then the site, um, the Scarborough plan review process taking us into sometime in September with uh, a likely visit back to uh, see all of you uh, later this summer uh, with additional plans and, and uh, responses to your, your questions and concerns. So uh, that's it this evening and certainly welcome any questions from you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to make public comment on this item? If you do, please just approach the podium. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of quickly summarize, if I could have somebody up there. Um, just, just in general, I just want to make sure uh, I focus our discussions uh, from the board well enough. Um, so my understanding is... Uh, Base, I'm taking basically staff comments right now, kind of going through the list of things that you've picked out and kind of addressed and said that, you know, we kind of like our plan better still, which, which is fine. You're, you're entitled to that, but I do believe that you deserve clarity between uh, and some sort of remedy between the staff comments and what your plan is So, as we go forward. So if I, if I get this correct, uh, you're happy with the parking. You would not like to see it downsized. Um, the spaces you're asking for are the ones you want. Correct. The sidewalk uh, through the proposed parking area, there's a 17-foot wide buffer strip, and I think you highlighted that for us. You have no intention of adding a sidewalk there, correct? Correct. Yeah, at first we'll, we'll confirm that that is the area you were, you were referring to in the domicile. Yes, correct. All right. Thanks. The other item I had here was um, the easterly, the wooden guardrail. 
which I, I know you've pointed out for snow storage, um, you you prefer not to have a guardrail there for for the purposes of potentially snow storage. We're looking for a solution that will effectively serve as the, serve the same purpose. So willing to look into alternatives. Correct. So we don't necessarily need to discuss that here if you're going to be working on that. So mark that off the list. And then last one. Um, Utility area located north of the proposed building includes aluminum screen fencing. So aluminum fencing versus stockade fencing versus any other type of fencing this board might want to throw out there. But yeah, you uh, prefer the one you're proposing. Correct. Thank you. So did I get them all? I mean, outside of those, you're pretty much agreeable with the rest of staff comments. The rest of the comments were just asking for clarification correct. and cohesion among the various plans. So yeah. Sure. Okay. Just want to make sure we direct uh, our conversations well enough up here. So I think what we'll do is we'll first tackle the, the biggest and largest issue, uh, which is the first one identified, which is the amount of parking uh, on the site. Does anyone want to start off with uh, thoughts as to the amount of spaces being requested, the location, utilization, et cetera? Do you want to go? You're the parking guru. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, go ahead. Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> So um, I just have a question about um, whether or not you have any plans that your presentation and the material didn't really seem to address any form of um, um, transportation demand management or any sort of al alternate uh, transportation methods, any sort of encouragement programs for your employees or um, patrons to access this building or your campus in general in a way other than driving their own car there. Um, and that, so I'm just wondering uh, first, I guess, if you have a plan like that in place um, that you could share with us or speak to that. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I just think that is, so I, I sort of have a, an issue with the 85% um, parking because I feel like that's still you're still just building a lot of extra parking that you actually know that or anticipate that no one's going to park in but that at that rate of fullness 85% full um, you anticipate the patients and staff recognizing that as a problem so I just kind of in light of um, you know we had a <clears throat> brief workshop before this meeting talking about the impacts of um, impervious area on the town as a whole um, for a development of this size, that number of extra parking spaces just seems like a lot of impervious area to me. And, and I, I fully understand your math and your justification and, and everything behind that, but um, I, I'm still kind of struggling with that. So, sorry, you want me to respond or? Okay. Thanks. So first, the TDM plan. Um, happy to share with you the, the main medical center transportation demand management plan. In the organization, it's referred to as the commuter choice plan. Mm -hmm. um, we've had one in place since 2006. Uh, recently revised the plan and, and made it quite a bit more robust. We actually employ a full-time program manager to focus specifically on transportation demand management. Uh, some of the benefits that we offer, well, let me, let me start with the stick and then I'll talk about the carrot. So the stick is we charge all of our employees for parking. It's not free to, to employees. It's, it's, it's a nominal fee because obviously there's a, um, a, a gap in the um, folks that work for us. But uh, let alone we do charge for parking, which is um, one of the few companies who provide parking in the area that, that do do charge the carrot. So if you do, if as an employee you do commute via alternative modes, whether it's biking, walking, taking the bus, or carpooling, you can apply for uh, reimbursement of that nominal fee. In addition to being eligible for reimbursement, there are um, certain benefits of being part of the commuter choice program at Maine Medical Center. One of that, one of which is you get entered into sort of a pool of um, you're eligible for prizes. So recently we did a 
carpool challenge, the folks who logged the most hours or most miles uh, uh, shared were eligible for a $100 gift card to Hannaford's. Handed three of those out. Um, that's just an, uh, an example of some of the, the carrots that we offer in, in the plan. I'm happy to share the entire plan with you. We do have a goal in that plan within five years of reducing about 5% of our single occupancy vehicles. Now that goal is focused on the Bram Hall campus because of um, the density of that campus, but we're looking at the, the impact of expanding that goal and what it may mean to other properties in the Portland area. Yeah, so I do think that would be um, helpful. I would like to read through that. Um, and I would be curious along with that, what sort of success you've seen with that plan since 2006? Um, and what, you know, your, for your forecasted goals for the impact that that might have on your, um, your staff. Um, and also whether or not it doesn't appear based on what you've submitted that you're sort of factoring that in in any way into your um, parking calculations for this site. Correct me if I've missed that in some place. Um, but, you know, for example, a decrease by 5% in single occupancy vehicle trips means that that would be 5% less parking spaces that you would need, right? Um, so I think, you know, that could, that could certainly help in this case. Um, so yes, sorry, long-winded answer. I would like to read that. Okay. And uh, that sounds um, great. A lot of companies aren't doing that or at least aren't following through on that. So it's good to know that you do have that in place. And I think that it's worth um, sharing and heralding that you do have you know, um, success with your employees in a program like that. Um, but none of it sounds like it applies to your patient population. And I know that sometimes that's more difficult because people are coming for appointments at a, you know, at a specific time, but those are all trips to um, and parking that would be required. So um, I think it would be great if you could uh, think of a way to sort of try and address some of those trips and parking needs through that program as well. Um, I do have a question about the parking inventory that you did and you said that you didn't include this out this other outlying lot because you didn't think that it was um, convenient or utilized i guess um, by patients or staff but i'm so i'm curious then who who is who is parking there or is it not being used uh staff do you park there um we were talking before the meeting actually there was a rule on campus that that was the only place that staff could park. Um, to be honest, we haven't done a great job of enforcing that over the recent years. Uh, and there has been some takeover of that lot as projects are built on sure. campus. It's used as sort of a staging area. Um, so. Okay, it seemed, I, I feel like that, that definitely stuck out to me when I was reading through this, that, that you, you know, it was intentional that that was not counted in that area um, but if you're intending to keep it as parking inventory and you're saying that it is still used by staff, I, it just seems like it would be appropriate to, um, to include it or somehow represent its use. Yeah, and, and when I say it's, it's used currently by staff, it, it, it's used by staff in 100 campus. And as you look at the map there, it's, that's the most proximate sure. to, the, to the building. Um, the folks in 96, which is the building at the top of the screen, use the parking lots to the top left or top right of the screen. So once the, the new building is in place, um, one, the parking from the yellow box to the new building is, a, is quite, a, quite a long haul. Um, so, you know, building parking proximate to the proposed building is really the, the focus. Um, okay, and then last sort of a detailed question about the um, the raised crosswalks that you're proposing. Um, none of them are dimensioned. I'm curious if you can speak to the the width across the top of those at all, and what the um, how long a uh, transition area you're proposing on either side. And they're probably all a little bit different, but 
Just I'm going to call a Sebago lifeline. <laughs> so. Phone a friend. Yeah. I actually would have been pretty surprised if you could answer that. I'm sorry. It would have been really impressive. Uh, Will Conway, Sebago Technic. So uh, from one point as you're approaching it to the other is 30 feet. So up the, and over the top. Yeah, so okay. 10 so feet up, 10 feet. 10 feet level, 10 feet down. Okay, and that's okay with fire department? Have they looked at that? We don't know. It's been reviewed by the fire department. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, I think, Robin, I think you, did I see your hand up about the parking? Sure did. Um, I guess I'd like to see, or maybe suggest, Yeah, I think that there were, yes, make sure we're talking about the same one here. Yeah, it's, it's uh, this one here. Yeah, that's the plan. That's a great question. I'm going to have to phone a friend again. Robin, I'm just going to quickly care. Is this parking space related? Is that why you're going down this path at this moment? Can we hold off on that for? Yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> I just want to get through this topic and get some clarity around this. Um, I'll weigh in as well for the parking space. You're, you're finishing that. Um, I, you know, I would prefer to see a situation where you you could mark it on the plan as, you know, could be developed later. Um, where I, I just, I hate to see so much impervious surface. You've acknowledged that you're probably not going to use up to 15% of what you're paving. And then on top of it, if your plans work on getting people to share rides and things like that, we're talking another 5% reductions. It just seems like a lot of impervious surface when you already have some spots. And yes, agreed, not that close to the building. But yet again, I think there's probably... And we've done this with other applicants before in the past, which is you designate it on the plan as can be built out, not necessarily something that you're building out right from the right from the get-go. And if you do find that you need it, you know there are there are ways that you know you can go about not having to go through this process, design it as such, um, and you can work with the town directly to to take advantage of those extra spots. So that yes. I would just ask the word quality mm -hmm. treatments be considered for both. The we'll build out. and future kind of thing. So even if it's built in 10 years, guess what? The water quality treatment is probably going to be 10 times you know, more advanced, but we've also missed the boat as far as asking for water quality to evolve with the regulations. Yes, Rachel. Yeah, as, as I recall at the last meeting, the, um, the parking lot, I guess, to the north of the new building uh, that had originally been um, planned as a parking lot and never built on, kind of what Nick was talking about. We had talked about that as staff only, uh, as a, a way to free up the upper spaces for the patients, for the clients who come in and go, and that down below be more long term. I don't see, I, I could not find any change in that. Is that Still on the drawing board? So the staff the, only? Yes, the, the target is to use this lot here as primarily a staff area. 
but the other uh, point you brought up is about what, what we referred to as the paper parking, which was yeah. put in place when uh, this ambulatory surgical center was built several years ago. So this proposed staff parking would go in place of that paper parking. Right. Has there been any evidence that that parking was needed by the ambulatory? No. So this would be solely needed because of the new building? Correct. Uh, I, as I'm looking at it, I'm wondering why, if, if you really need the four, essentially four rows, if it's possible to uh, eliminate one of those rows, uh, and potentially again for paper parking, keeping it as paper parking, but to, to start off with, get rid of one of those rows and uh, eliminate some of the, uh, some of the impervious uh, surface without interfering with the needs of the, the patients? Uh, we are looking at some uh, value engineering options right now that involve this parking area in particular. Um, in future submissions, you may see a change there that uh, aligns with what you're suggesting. I think that would be a really good idea and a good change to see. All right, thank you. Roger, Rick, do you have anything to add to the parking space? Since I brought up the EV back when you were here before, it's great to see two spots. But if you're looking at all of those parking spots, I think that's just a trivial uh, number. And I stress the point that staff parking is also a, a perfect lot to put these things in because those cars are going to stay there longer. So you can put the lower cost chargers in. You don't have to go for the level three fast chargers. Um, that you'll see in some of these new establishments. So um, you well, could get you well, could get a smile on my face a little bit more uh, for the number of parking spots you're going for if you increase the number of EV opportunities. I can I can double it from two to four. Wow. So we've got we do have four in this plan. Um, there's two here. Yeah. Uh, small yellow box here, and then there are two additional uh, here. So two on the patient. Uh, side two on the staff side with ability to add additional in the future. That's a little bit better, but maybe we can <laughs> maybe we can get you to rough out at least put some conduit in the ground for future. If we're talking about these number of spots that you're you're looking, I'm kind of coming from you know best what your facility is going to need in terms of providing a good customer experience so I'm not going to to uh, be too hard line on the number of spots so I'll, I'll let my colleagues take care of the, the, the runoff and all that kind of stuff um, but that's where I'm coming from at this point Nick a um, little trade-off on getting some EVs for additional spots might make it softer for me thank you <clears throat> Roger. Um, in the presentation you mentioned uh, the other gentleman mentioned that uh, you're consolidating five other locations. Um, is it we have you ever, uh, been able to determine the uh, the parking in those five locations and made any correlation to what you're requesting here? Um, yes, um, and in fact, it's a it's an excellent question with a segue. Um, the 5.5, and I'll give you a little background. I, I've been doing this specifically with Maine Medical Partners, Maine Medical Center for 25 years now. So I actually came to start this medical group. Uh, and before that was at another medical group here locally. So I have a fair amount of experience with how patients come to visit their doctors and how that differs this specialty to this specialty to that. So just to give you a sense of scale, you know, there are practices where our patients are coming, they're spending a long time. They're there for an hour, they're there for two hours low parking demand. Uh, in our dermatology practice, those doctors see 40 to 50 patients a day each. High parking demand, much higher than 5.5. So when we got to 5.5, it was after Steve Kasabian made some fairly substantial arguments for a much larger number, because I'm not exaggerating when I describe wars in the parking lot of the neurosurgery building today because there's no parking 
and it's a substantial parking ratio, not 5.5, but approaching 5. So we've got high, high demand. It's not unusual for a patient coming for a neurology or a neurosciences appointment to come with their entourage, I say, their family members, the husband, the wife, the mom, the dad. There's lots of cars that come in a single appointment. That is not an unusual circumstance in these kinds of practices. We're talking vascular surgery, really sick people. So all of that weighs into the math. So as we're describing parking, that is hard for us to get our brains around because it's so different than other industries or businesses. That's the sort of real life drama that plays out. But to answer your question, that was a bit of a, of a side skirt. Um, the other locations that we have are significantly under-resourced for parking, so we're ending up with very unhappy patients, patients very late for appointments, waiting 15 minutes, 30 minutes, just to find a parking spot. Um, and it gets from horrible to moderately horrible in those locations. So all of that is fodder for us to understand how to do this right the first time and make sure that these patients, again, these are some of our sickest patients that we're talking about that will be cared for in this building. So that's where we're coming from. Um, th I have a question pertaining to what Robin was trying to bring up, mm -hmm. if I may. Sure. Um, I assume, and maybe Angela could weigh in on this as well, is uh, when, when they're doing this stormwater evaluations, they're basing it on 500 parking spaces, I assume. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I just wanted to clarify clarification on that. Um, I'm I'm inclined to um, agree with Rick that they they know what their needs are. They're consolidating this facility because prim it sounds to me primarily because of the inconvenience to a lot of the, of their patients, and um, so I I'm inclined to give them some leeway on this assuming the stormwater and everything else you know um, is is in compliance with this 500 parking spaces mm -hmm. oh, one one other yeah. question I, I don't know can I ask about the um, the um, utility you know the screening oh you want to hold off on that? Uh, the, no I just kind of want to go one by one on these topics okay. just All so right. we can All right. give these guys a clarity and staff as well okay. as to which direction sure Angela Or, or just highly incentivized parking there. Like you already, you, it, that is a good, that does sound like a good compromise to me. And I, I understand the, um, you know, the request for treating the water, but like you already have this area paved and it's a parking lot and there would be a cost associated with building a new parking lot given, you know, there is an advantage to being closer to the building that you're looking for, but you know, if you made that free for your staff to park there, they would park there and that lot would be full. Um, and those are people assuming that are coming at the beginning of their day and then leaving at the end of the day and not needing to you know, circulate and necessarily be as close to the front door. Somebody might enjoy that walk to their, you know, to their office, whether it's whatever building it is. Um, so I just, you know, I, I think there's certainly some options here. I. Um, I've, I've looked for parking in your, <laughs> your lot where your neuro, ser neuro um, services are, and it is frustrating. Um, so I, I, I totally appreciate the, um, your history and your experience there, but I do, I do just think with a little creativity, there, there could be some ways to address a lot of parking that you're proposing. Thank you. So uh, without <clears throat> without getting um, you know to a definite spot, 
we I think what you are hearing is we'd like to just see something a little bit more creative try to get creative with this and you've got time we know you still got to go through the DEP process I think uh, I think it would benefit everyone if you could just really kind of mold this situation over and see if there's something a little bit more you can be done um, so I you know that's my sense at this point you know really take a look at it I think that's a good suggestion from Angela as well if it's an underutilized space can we convert it back into green space you know that's also good so uh, so for that one, I think at this point you've heard a kind of a mixed message from the, this board, but I think we're all open to um, listening to what you have to say. Uh, traditionally, if you, you know, have returned on the TV at night and viewed this programming, um, you would often hear me say personally that I, I would lean towards an applicant's uh, request just because I know there's a cost associated with extra asphalt and all the other work that goes into it and not that any applicant would undertake that lightly. So um, here I just I cringe a little to hear an applicant say we know we're only going to use about 85% of it or at least we're pretty sure we're going to only use 85% of it. So um, anyways, what you could do for opportunity on that front, I think we'll look forward to hearing for through your next round, okay? Thanks for the feedback. Um, as far as uh, the next topic, why don't we actually circle back to Robin um, because I don't think stormwater really came up. Um, and any of the points circled on the staff area. So, Robin, if you want to jump into that before I get into the bullets over here. Yeah, I'd, <clears throat> I'd be happy to. Would you mind if we're reminded why they said they wouldn't take staff's suggestions for a new, an additional sidewalk? The 17-foot wide landscaped area. Can you just remind us why staff's recommended re recommendation was not So the sidewalk supported? that you're referring to is, is located here in this um, most easterly parking lot primarily because we don't think one it'll be used effectively uh, and are trying to manage costs as we move through the project How wide is that? Uh, this, about snow on that? this stretch <laughs> is 17 feet in total there are the landscape plan does uh, propose trees for this area um, so it won't have any snow it, well, I think the, the idea is to maintain some level of flexibility as to how the space is used. If um, we can store some snow on it without impacting negatively impacting the plantings and the trees, we'll do that. Can, can we ask uh, what staff's sort of intent was in asking for the sidewalk? I think the idea was just to provide for an, a safer place for pedestrians to access the sidewalks that come from the proposed network in the outer reaches of that large parking lot instead of walking across. I mean, folks will walk where they want, but giving them the option was that what, where the suggestion came from. Is it rooted in ordinance? Um, yeah, I mean, it, the ordinance is pretty open to providing for adequate pedestrian connections. Then so. I don't know why we wouldn't. I mean, is it, <clears throat> why is it optional? Why is it optional? You're the one that sets the regulation. I, I, we'd prefer not to do it. We don't think it'll be used. But at the end of the day, you're the one approving the plan. Mm -hmm. So you're the one to answer that question. Okay. Then it may not be optional. I don't know. Maybe we should discuss it, Mr. Chair. It's, yeah, what do you, what do you consider an adequate pedestrian way? So isn't that, isn't that ultimately the question? So, you know, staff is recommending a sidewalk be put in. They don't think there's one that's needed, and that's why it's a bullet point here that we were going to go through. So, um, anyone else on that? Yes, go ahead, Roger. Uh, the the thing is, in good weather, people are going to walk over the island and just go directly to where they want to go. In the winter, when there's snow there, they're going to walk down where a sidewalk would normally be, because they're not going to walk through the snow. You know what I mean? So, I mean. I'm, I'm not wedded to the necessity of having a sidewalk there, but. Jen, Rick, would you like to weigh in? Is this an area that you are eyeing for? So you're not necessarily going to specify a different parking areas for staff and patients, or are you? 
Uh, we are, as I said earlier, the, the northerly lot that's proposed is going to be primarily staff uh, for the proposed building. Okay. However, we haven't thought through completely how uh, we'll be asking staff for 96 campus to park, as I mentioned earlier. Um, currently, they park in the lot that's in that location. So that's likely going to be the solution. We just haven't dictated that yet. Still not understanding why it's optional. There's pedestrian walkways through the parking lot, correct? So it's how many, how long? Are we um, talking about building 94? The proposed building is building 94, correct? Yeah. And this is right off the entrance me, to that let me back up and give some context here so the proposed building 94 is here the sidewalk we're discussing is here you can see my cursor here. rachel would you like to weigh in um well no but i will <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I, I think the sidewalk is needed. Um, I, I know folks will make their own way across things, but I, uh, the far end of that parking lot, um, folks will come down and get onto the sidewalk at various angle, at various places, and then use that, some of them, to go directly down to the uh, 96 or 94. 94 yeah. Um, and in the winter, it needs to be kept clean so that folks can actually find a way to to navigate through the through the snow, not on not on the road, not where the snow banks are, but actually a, uh, a convenient place. And given the number of um, us older folks there, I, I would prefer a nice, smooth, walkable area. So. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues. I think uh, I think you should add it on to your plan for the next round. Yeah. Next topic uh, we had for a bullet. You said you're going to work on the wooden guardrail or some sort of similar, uh, so we don't need to cover that. Uh, fence, aluminum screen fence versus a stockade fence. Um, do, do we have a picture of what it is? I mean, I, you know, if, I think that that's something that we'd want to see. I think that's what it comes down to is I think you're looking at an aesthetic quality here. Um, and I don't want to belabor a, a discussion on, on some fencing. So I think aesthetically, you know, you've got to have some idea of what we look for here in Scarborough with architecture and making sure th things look great. Um, so I, I don't see a need for a board discussion on that topic, but um, definitely pr some sort of, you know. Would it be helpful if we provided a picture next sure. time we yeah. came to That would visit? be great. That we'll would do be that. Great. Mr. Chair, and just <clears throat> along the same lines, I, I think uh, for, in the interest of time, I think we definitely need more detail on both stormwater and signage, the signage plan kind of a thing. So I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of you or going or circling back. No, I think uh, signage was covered pretty well okay. in um, staff's comments. So I think they're, they had no issue with any of the stack of recommendations on that front um, on stormwater. Is there anything in particular? Yeah, they still have some, they have some cleanup on the stormwater front too, so. All right, um, is there anything else? Yes. Um, just, just to revisit the parking for just a moment, um, I think Jen brought up an interesting point about the parking at 100 campus. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if I recall, when that, w that property was developed, you basically took the existing Kmart parking space, and it's the same space. So I'm just wondering if you've ever revisited that to see if you need all that space, as Jen was mentioning, and that might be, you know, an area where you can uh, recoup some, some, some land. You know, just because I, it seems to me that was just there, so you just, you know, paved it, landscaped it, and pretty much that was it. Yeah, we did inherit a lot when that building yeah. was purchased. Yeah. So. So we'll take a, a closer look at that and come back with a. Okay. Strong Thank answer. you. I appreciate it. Good luck, guys. We'll see you in a few months. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I've got a, just a couple of questions and observations just for my information. Um, one, I, I would like to say to the, the, uh, the, the client that I really appreciate the work that's been done in terms of the, the trails around the campus, uh, the walkways, and the benches that create a placemaking area. Uh, there was one notice about the side of the building um, where you suggested that you were going to be planting uh, trees because we had the concern about the blank wall. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that just planting trees is enough, but I can't at this point remember what that wall looked like. In the past where we've had blank walls, uh, we've at requested some sort of differentiation in terms of, of the architecture, so it looks as though there are features on that wall. And if what you're doing is simply planting trees, it's going to take 20 years before they're tall enough to really obscure the section and create scale. So I'd appreciate it if you would think about that. And I had a question on the uh, EV sta charging stations. Are they free or charge? Is this a service to the community? or? Uh, it'd be a service to anybody using our services in the building. All right, and what are the uh, what are the hours of operation? Uh, it varies per practice. Uh, as we mentioned, there's neuroscience in the building. There's vascular surgery. There's ENT. Uh, those fluctuate some somewhat, but generally, 7:30 to I believe there's no patient appointment made after 4:30. Right. So the uh, the the chargers would be turned off after a certain time. Uh, good question. I, I can get an answer for you. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Next item on the agenda tonight. Crossroad Holdings LLC requests a supplemental traffic and transportation review as part of a planned development project for the Downs Innovation District, 90 Payne Road, Assessor's Map, R52, Lot 4, non-action item. Jamel. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you guys know, this project is in the Crossroads Plan Development District. Uh, and the phase two is the northerly portion of the Downs property with access uh, off of Payne Road. Uh, so the applicant was granted preliminary subdivision approval by the board in April. And they're in front of the board tonight with a supplemental traffic and transportation information uh, in advance of the final subdivision review for phase two at the Downs. So the applicants provided a narrative and plans to outline their approach to transportation design, mitigation, and permitting for phase two and the overall project going forward. Staff would like to note that this submission is for informational purposes only and no action is required by the board this evening. So at the time, I'll turn, the, turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jamal. Dan? Uh, good evening, uh, Planning Board. Dan Bacon here on behalf of m &R Holdings Crossroad. Holdings LLC and the Downs team. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation and then Randy Dunton uh, with Goral Palmer is going to jump in and talk about the technical details on, on traffic and transportation. Um, and I know you have a big agenda, so I'll, I'll keep it going and, and focus on, on the topic at hand. Uh, the board's um, seen the innovation district, uh, the phase two subdivision a number of times. But just to orient you and, and to make sure, uh, this portion of the project is up by Payne Road and it's primarily a light industrial commercial area um, that we've been before the board a number of occasions before. Um, it's fairly close to exit 42 and it's in the area that specifically allows for those light industrial manufacturing type uses. Um, this is a, a larger overall subdivision, and we have a, a phasing plan um, proposed to the board as part of the subdivision plan. And it's really the light industrial kind of manufacturing uses in an early phase of that that's driving uh, the permitting for this. There's a lot of interest in, in the economic development opportunities uh, within this part of the project. It's also pretty important to the town from a uh, economic development standpoint. So there's some end users that know about the project and that are uh, very interested in uh, locating here. So this sketch uh, or rendering shows that part of the subdivision. And to kind of put this part into context, you know, we've been working with the board for uh, pretty close to a year in terms of the overall process for, for this phase two aspect. Um, we had the site inventory analysis uh, last August, so last summer. 
similar to the item that's next on your agenda for a different part of the site. It's really the exist existing conditions plan. We reviewed the master plan um, in October and December of last year, which is really the framework for the layout of the subdivision and the guidelines and space and bulk standards, uh, and then jumped into the preliminary subdivision review step um, over the winter and spring. Received approval for that in April, and I've been kind of hard at work on uh, the final updates and revisions for the final subdivision plan. As part of that, we're working closely with the, the state, federal, uh, public utilities. We've received uh, water district approval and sanitary district approval for this phase two, and we're still working with DEP, um, DOT, and the Army Corps of Engineers. So DOT is the really the topic at hand this evening and, and trying to dovetail the planning board's approvals and review with, with theirs. So this subdivision plan is, is obviously for commercial and, and primarily light industrial development, so non-residential development, which is a good bit different than uh, typical subdivisions, which are for residential lots. Typically, uh, you'd approve a residential subdivision and then you wouldn't see it again. Um, you'd only approve the subdivision and then lot development would, would happen. So with a commercial and light industrial subdivision, um, as some of you I'm sure know, what this does is it really is the threshold permit, so it enables lots to be sold, it establishes the infrastructure to serve those lots, it, it comes up with some phasing, it also estimates the likely build out um, and, and what offsite improvements need to be. But every lot in every development needs to come to the board um, for site plan review, or at least come to the town. So this is really kind of the first bite at the apple. And site plan review is, is triggered, and it helps a lot in terms of this traffic and transportation um, aspect of, of this part of the project. At site plan, Randy uh, and his team uh, will know the end users for each lot. They can calculate the traffic generation, the trips that that lot development um, bears. And then that sets up a great kind of tracking system so that the project and the board knows, okay, you designed this intersection to have this much capacity. Well, as site plan reviews occur, you understand how much capacity is being used, and we can kind of track when offsite improvements are needed. So this works well with kind of a multi-phase uh, permitting approach, and I think it really kind of helps with how we gear uh, the offsite improvements in an incremental basis. So to, to illustrate that a little bit, uh, this is the overall subdivision plan uh, that you've certainly seen before. And what's anticipated is that this is gonna, this is gonna be phased. Um, the infrastructure will be first phased coming in from Payne Road. So the Downs Road's gonna be improved um, about 1,000 feet uh, from Payne Road to um, the proposed Innovation Way and then Innovation Way will be built to access the first phase of lots, which we're proposing be this area. Um, as development occurs and these lots are, are built on and site plan review occurs, we'd anticipate a second phase of light industrial development, which creates that additional roadway, and then those lots uh, can be activated and come to the board for site plan review. And the same would be true for a third phase and those lots. And so we're kind of gearing that build out in that way for the light industrial aspect of the project. Um, as you know, there's lot one, lot 1A and 1B, which are really more commercial oriented lots along Payne Road and along the entrance to the Downs Road. So we anticipate those will need a different set of improvements along Payne Road, just given the traffic generation associated with, say, a shopping center or a gas station. So we anticipate improvements need, needing to be made along Payne Road um, that then can activate development on those lots. So I wanted to kind of provide that visual to give you a sense for how uh, phasing is likely to occur. And since um, the light industrial aspect of this phase is really the driver. It's really the short-term end users that we know are really interested in coming to the downs. Um, we are phasing uh, really the permitting. So 
in each of those three light industrial phases, there's about 18 lots. One has 18, one has 17, one has 19. So they're balanced in terms of number of lots, adding up to 54. They're also balanced in terms of the amount of traffic they generate. Um, each phase is forecast to generate between 190 to 200 trips, you know, plus or minus, and that's all based on um, forecasting. You know, so one lot may have a much larger building uh, with a lot of employees, another might be a smaller building, or there could be a larger warehousing component with not many employees. But that's what Randy's forecasting. And so for that first phase, we're calling 2A, that first light industrial phase, we're forecasting a generation, a trip generation of 195 p.m. peak hour trips, um, which is what DOT uh, regulates. And that's what we're applying for to, to DOT to allow for that number of trips that can be captured under a first traffic <coughs> movement permit. Because that's what's known today in terms of users. That's what is manageable in terms of an initial phase of improvements to the Downs Road and then to Payne Road where it connects into the Downs Road. We also know that um, the design of the Downs Road is being done in a way that creates more capacity than that first phase um, so that there's adequate turn lanes and, and improvements that Randy will present next um, that can certainly get past the 195 p.m. peak hour trips. But that's what we're applying for the DOT first, just to enable uh, an initial permit to be reviewed and, and issued. So I wanted to provide that sort of permitting context in, in phasing context before Randy presents the initial uh, set of improvements planned for on the Downs Road in the Payne Road intersection. Good evening, uh, members of the board and staff. Uh, Randy Dunton with Goral Palmer. Um, just to kind of follow up on what Dan was just talking about, uh, as far as permitting goes, uh, just so you're aware, this is uh, currently with the Maine Department of Transportation. There is a scoping meeting planned for uh, June 19th, um, in which, you know, obviously the town is a participant at that scoping meeting, as well as Mr. Bray, uh, your traffic peer reviewer. Um, I'd just like to take a minute to go through uh, the kind of the infrastructure and the design um, and show you what uh, what's anticipated up front. Uh, over to the far right, this is Innovation Way. Um, for orientation purposes, uh, what's horizontal is Scarborough Downs Road. Uh, this is Innovation Way over here, and this is Payne Road right here with Holmes Road right here. I'm trying to get the laser. Ah, look at that. Um, so we'll start over to the far right. And uh, this is an unsignalized intersection of Innovation Way uh, with Scarborough Downs Road. And the idea is that there'll be separate left and right turn lanes coming out of Innovation Way. Uh, initially, there will be uh, separate left and right turn lanes with a bicycle lane in this area here. What you see as bright green is actually a raised center median. Um, and just throughout this whole project, um, the center median, the, the, the project is designed such that um, everything is going to branch out um, and expand outward. So what's sh shown is center medians will always be there. Um, there's no intent to remove those or change those. Um, but as the project grows, as the site increases in trips, uh, it will expand out from that center median. As you move further to the left, you'll see a break in the center median here with a left turn lane. Um, and there is a driveway that will go into lots uh, sometime in the future. But as you travel to the left on Scarborough Downs Road, you approach Payne Road. Um, as you most likely know, uh, as you approach now, as you approach Payne Road, uh, there's a slight curve up. There's a slight incline as you approach Payne Road. That's going to be taken out. Um, 
Scarborough Downs Road currently is a single uh, approach lane that's going to be widened to separate left through and right along with a, um, a bicycle lane uh, that separates the right turn and the through lane. Um, on these three corners, there's going to be uh, radii improvements so that uh, vehicles can enter and exit Scarborough Downs Road more easily, uh, especially the larger vehicles. Um, on the other three approaches, the lane uses are not going to change. However, the queue of the uh, turning lanes will extend, uh, will be extended. So the number of lanes is going to stay the same on the other three approaches. It's just that the queue is going to, going to increase. Um, this initial phase, uh, these improvements are intended to provide a level of service C or above um, for the peak hours. So they have more than enough uh, capacity to absorb future improvements without being widened. Um, there, will, there is uh, a point at which point um, there will have to be some widening, but again, it's all designed to widen outward. Um, for orientation purposes, this is Payne Road, this is Holmes Road, and this is the Scarborough Downs Road. Again, uh, this is your center median here and here. Those are raised. Um, now this shows that, <coughs> as I mentioned, uh, the approach lane now for Scarborough Downs Road is a single lane. Because that's the through lane is getting shifted over, um, Holmes Road needs to be widened on this particular side uh, to align with the realigned uh, through lane on Scarborough Downs Road. This approach, the left turn lane, is uh, getting extended. The lanes, the left turn lane on Holmes Road is getting slightly extended. And the left turn lane and right turn lane on Payne Road are also getting extended. But the, again, the lane uses are going to remain as they are today. Um, and again, this uh, is intended, this design is expected to not only accommodate the initial phase 2A, what we're calling phase 2A, but is also expected to accommodate uh, significantly more than that because you can't build half a lane. Um, you know, you, you automatically, as soon as you, you make improvements, you um, create capacity for the future. Now, one of the comments uh, that was raised, and I'd like to go through Mr. Bray's comments uh, that are germane to, to tonight's um, presentation, but one of Bill's comments was, um, you know, a potential um, signalization improvements at the intersection. Um, right now, you currently have what's called a span wire, which means there's a wire going across each of the approaches, and uh, there's signal heads are hung from that. All of that is going away with this initial phase 2A. There are going to be mast arms with brand new signal heads, uh, brand new traffic controller, brand new um, vehicle detection system. So all of that, all of the existing signal equipment is, is gone and it's going to be all new signal equipment. Now, Mr. Bray, um, wrote a memo dated uh, May 31st, and again, he had some, some comments, and I'd like to go through those comments briefly. Um, now, uh, the first one that I'm going to say is the applicant is requested to provide copies of the capacity reports and traffic model for review. That's not a problem. We're going to be uh, providing those, and we expect to do a comment response letter uh, to this. Uh, and, and um, submit that to the town probably by the end of the week or beginning of early next week. Uh, one of the other comments is um, Mr. Bray asked for a detailed intersection capacity analysis. This, again, this is similar to the previous comment. We're going to provide him with uh, all the traffic modeling, all the capacity analysis, um, and all the results. Uh, one of his other comments was... Uh, 
he questioned the date in which the turning movement counts were completed. Um, we did them on June 6th. Technically, you had to wait until June 15th. Um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Bray said he has no problem with that. However, he questions whether or not Maine DOT will be concerned. We've already spoken with uh, Steve Landry, the state traffic engineer, um, at least a month ago. Um, and he has no concerns at all regarding um, the counts that were done, knowing that uh, we are coming right after this initial traffic movement permit um, to apply for a, a modification uh, to do additional work, and there are going to be all new traffic counts that are going to be completed this, uh, this summer. We expect to probably count in the neighborhood of 23 intersections this summer. Um, so that's not an issue. Um, one of the other comments that Mr. Bray had is um, documentation on the methodology used in determining the annual growth rate. Uh, we certainly will uh, provide that. Uh, another comment is uh, re uh, traffic solutions recommended that the proposed traffic island on Holmes Road, uh, on the Holmes Road approach, be a raised island initially. He's talking about this island right here. Initially, this was shown as striped. Um, that is now proposed to be a raised median. And the purpose of the raised part is that uh, we may at some point uh, in a design um, put the mast arms at those locations. The, the island may be slightly wider than it's currently shown, and the mast arms would be located there. And it's to provide a more efficient um, signalization of the intersection. Uh, one of other, uh, another one of Mr. Bray's comments is, um, again, he asked that superimpose the existing span wire system and that signal heads and controller cabinets uh, may need to get modified. All of the signal equipment is gone and all new equipment. So that item will be addressed. Um, and that's, that's it for, he had a couple other items, but they were kind of long-term uh, scenarios, if you will, and they certainly will be addressed, um, but they're not part of uh, tonight's presentation. With that, I'll hand it back over to Dan. <clears throat> Thanks, Randy. Um, another component related to traffic, and this is discussed at one of the last board meetings, was the kind of phasing plan and incremental nature of, of use of the private roads, or the, the, the private road um, that some don't understand is private, uh, being the Downs Road from Payne Road to Route 1. Um, and we've been working with uh, the team's attorney uh, on a memorandum of understanding that would uh, make it clear that the public can use um, the Downs Road and to have that in place so that um, some amount of traffic, I think it's a fairly modest amount early on of phase two uh, traffic would can and, and will use um, that driveway, um, a road surface down to, to Route 1. I think Randy has distribution numbers that suggest that's, that's a small minority of traffic, just given how the distance and also <laughs> the, the general traffic distribution of the light industrial commercial area wanting to gravitate to, to Payne Road um, as well as I-95. Um, but we'll have that agreement in place as part of the final subdivision plan review and approval. Um, and as time goes on um, and future phases are designed and then built, then that, that um, interconnections, the interconnections and the travel pattern alignment will change. Um, and we're working on some concepts for the, for the core of the project, which, which, which you know, obviously would, would change those routes. And that will be staged with construction and with phasing so that it's, that it's open to the public for that use. So really kind of in, in closing, um, we're 
We're working on really a phased approach to, to traffic permitting and traffic planning. This project is incredibly <laughs> uh, incremental and there's a lot of phases and there's phases within phases. Um, so we're trying to figure out how best to kind of manage the, the design and permitting process to jive with those phases, get ahead of transportation improvements, but not so far ahead of the improvements that they're speculative and that they're not, they're not correct. Um, and that's really why we're approaching the innovation district this way. Um, DOT um, is reviewing, as Randy said, an initial permit um, that, that addresses what we know is real. And we know an initial phase in the innovation district's real based on interest that we're getting without approved lots and want to be in a position to have that permit and act, act on that permit and design an improvement plan that um, can handle that traffic and handle more than that traffic, but not so much speculating on the uses uh, on lot one or on other parts of the project. And so as Randy indicated, uh, we want to work with the board on a sort of phased approach for um, off-site improvements that coordinates with DOTs. And then, but we're jumping right back into this summer and into the fall, a larger traffic movement permit that, that can address the bigger picture um, and collecting all of those counts in July so that we have a comprehensive look at the traffic for the levels of traffic that really need that look. Um, so that's really the next step uh, after this final subdivision is to, as a future TMP um, based on some known users that we think are going to happen in the center of the project and to account for additional phases in the innovation district. Um, so as Randy indicated, we're designing these transportation improvements to be easily phased, kind of designing from the center in, so expansions can occur um, outwards and the islands and the, the core improvements can remain and not be kind of reconstructed uh, in the future. Um, the other component to that is uh, Bill Bray mentioned under uh, his memo that's longer term, as Randy indicated, interest in a TDM plan, so Transportation Demand Management Plan, and we are equally interested in doing that. We've been talking to the transit agencies, I think, as the board is aware. Um, but we really need kind of more known end users to, to really develop that plan and to, to have it be effective. Um, and so we're identifying this future TMP modification as really being the suitable stage to get into transportation demand management, get into really knowing what the transit service uh, wants to do in terms of coming to the innovation district. Um, and at that point, I think we're hopeful to have enough end users kind of under construction that you can start to have shared trips. You can start to have a relationship between phase one and the innovation district and some things that can be happening in the center of the project in the next couple of years. So we're really on board with the TDM planning. It's just really the timing of it and think that uh, the next DOT application is the right time versus uh, this initial phase. So that's what we have for a presentation um, and we're here for questions for the board from the board. Uh, is there anyone here from the public that wanted to just comment on anything that they just heard? No? Okay. Um, leave this kind of open. Does anyone want to add a thought or a suggestion or have a question on what we've just heard? Roger. Just a thought. I, I think it looks uh, looks like you're doing a good job. I, I'm impressed with the process so far. That's my thought. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Anyone else have anything to add? I have a question. Um, for some of the, it looks like there's sort of some long stretches of median um, that you're proposing. Any thought given at this stage to incorporating um, any stormwater treatment there? We're incorporating landscaping um, along the, the Downs Road from Payne Road to the Innovation Way. The, um, the, the street so far has been designed to storm waters off to the edges. Um, and so uh, we have an, a, not knowing how wide the road's gonna be from right. a design standpoint, it's right. been a lot more predictable to approach it that way versus um, the reverse like Route 1 is 
on Route 1 in Scarborough. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Any other questions? All right. Rachel. Yeah, I just I have a question on um, what are the plans for starting to rough out the Hygus Parkway connection? It's a good segue to the next agenda item. <laughs> Um, we are looking at access point to access points to Haggis Parkway. Uh, we are um, forced into looking at it even closer, um, given one of your other applicants if a month or two ago across the street. So we've been working with DOT on that um, specifically and to, to coordinate with them in terms of offsetting the intersections and the driveways. Um, and so as part of the master plan process for the center of the project, which will be coming to you later this summer, we'll kind of, that was really loud. Apologize for that. Um, <laughs> we'll be showing that connection and, and the capacity that's needed along Haggis Parkway to, to make that connection. So um, it's, there's a limited window really for where that road can go based on kind of wetlands and stream crossings so that natural resources are going to dictate the location that is in, in large part as well. All right. Anything else? Richard? All right. Thank you very much. Um, before we segue into that next project, we are going to take a quick five minute break. All right. Thank you.
Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone back. We're going to introduce the next item, which is Crossroads, Hold Crossroads Holdings LLC requests a site inventory and analysis review for Scarborough Downs. Assessor's map R52, lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project before you is the remaining land in the Downs development. Uh, they've called it the core district, consisting of approximately 325 acres. Uh, so the applicants in front of the board for a site inventory and analysis. Um, so the board should be sure to determine if the information provided uh, provides a clear understanding of the site and identifies opportunities and constraints that will guide the utilization of the site. It's the expectation that the preparation of this will result in a master plan for the plan development. So staff has found the applicant has generally satisfied the requirements for uh, this review. A few comments. Uh, the applicant should discuss the areas that are unsuitable for development with the board tonight and show how these areas will be utilized going forward. And the applicant should also discuss how the grandstand and racetrack could be incorporated into the master plan given their historical significance at the state level. Uh, staff would like to point out the applicant has requested two waivers from the site inventory and analysis requirements and the board should consider the appropriateness of these requests and also be good to understand the timing of a potential wetlands peer review uh, as the project moves forward. And as we've done in the past, uh, the board may want to chat with the applicant about whether they want to hold a separate workshop meeting to review the master plan uh, for this portion of the property like we did for phases one and two. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Jamel. Dan? Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, Dan Bacon with uh, Crossroads Holdings LLC um, presenting on the site inventory analysis for the, the center of the project. Um, we're excited to be talking about the center already. Uh, it's really driven by uh, a lot of interest in the project and some end users that really belong in the center of the project. So we're excited to be kind of jumping into this aspect uh, this early on in the, in the planning and construction stages of the Downs. As Jamel introduced, this is the kickoff to the master plan and then future subdivision and site plan review uh, steps by the planning board. Um, this all started actually way back in January of 2018 in terms of overall plan development when we, uh, we were reviewed by the board and approved for an overall conceptual infrastructure plan, so a, kind of an overall framework for how infrastructure will be planned and ultimately constructed on the site. I think before a few board members were, were on the board. Um, and then uh, the expectation of the zoning is to kind of incrementally uh, come to the board for larger areas of the site, 50 acres or greater to do this site inventory and then do a master plan and then, um, then be permitted in a more detailed way. So, so this phase is really the uh, opportunities and constraints, the existing conditions, the, the lay of the land, if you will, um, before we work with you on a master plan for a specific area. So the, the core planning area, we haven't come up with a real jazzy name yet, so we're calling it the core <laughs> at this site inventory analysis stage. Um, I'm sure we'll get creative as we get into some development opportunities, but um, the core area is roughly 325 acres of, and it's uh, everything except for phase one and phase two. <laughs> Um, but it's the, the center of the project where obviously the grandstand is, the inner and outer track. Um, a significant amount of the area is um, existing developed land, meaning it was cleared and filled for parking for the track in the grandstand. Um, it's where the paddocks used to be, um, and there's still a few there. Um, and it's the you know, it has, does have front edge on Haggis Parkway, which is brought up under the last uh, agenda item. So there's uh, a portion of the core that fronts Haggis, and we expect to be designed, obviously, to, to interconnect with Haggis Parkway. There's an area that also has frontage or a, a connection to Payne Road, but that's largely wetlands. So we're relying on infrastructure from the Innovation District and, and Payne Road, like we talked about the last meeting, to ultimately provide one of the access points to the core. Um, in terms of the uh, vegetative cover, um, the existing vegetation out there, um, there's about 200 acres, a little bit more than 200 acres that's forested. Um, some of that's um, wetland area, some of it's 
um, previously undeveloped and some of it's previously developed that's reforested um, as the track and its use has um, been diminished over the years. 93 um, acres is grassed area. You see that in yellow. Um, most of that grassed area, though, used to be development of some kind, whether it was gravel parking or paved parking or the, uh, the paddocked areas that, as, again, time has gone on and the use has gotten less intense, it's, it's, um, it's been grown up into grass, um, but it's mowed typically and, and is in a, a grass condition. Um, there's about 15 acres of paved area, um, the Scrubber Downs Road, the other access roads, the parking for the grandstands that remains paved today, um, about 10 acres total of, of the track, um, both tracks um, combined, and then about two acres of building area, um, the grandstand, the uh, other ancillary buildings on the site. In terms of drainage um, and soils. Like I said earlier, a, a lot of this land area was, um, was filled and created back in the early, late 1940s. So about 45% is quote unquote man, uh, made land. Um, and, uh, and then there's a split between kind of hydric and non-hydric soils, so soils that are more likely to be wetlands and, and soils that aren't. Um, in terms of the watersheds, and we've presented on this uh, in the past with other areas of the project, um, but this part of the project drains to either Millbrook or uh, Willowdale Brook, and um, the plan on the screen shows kind of that divide. It's, it really follows the um, north to south. It follows uh, the western edge of the, of the track and the grandstand building. Um, where it splits between Millbrook to the east and, and uh, Willowdale to the west. In terms of the wetland resources, um, there's, that's shown on the screen in, in green, there's these larger pockets of wetlands, um, particularly up, up by Payne Road. So between the, um, the grandstand area, the center of the site, uh, up the frontage of Payne Road and on both sides of the Downs Road coming in from Payne Road, um, all told up in that area, it totals about 65 acres of, of wetlands um, with some uplands you know, in between, particularly off of the Downs Road. The other larger area of, of wetlands, uh, less concentrated but still a number of wetlands is along Highgate Parkway, um, between Highgate Parkway and Willowdale Brook. Um, and so there's roughly 28 acres of wetlands in that area. Um, Willowdale Brook um, is, is a pretty good grade change from the, the majority of the site down to the w Willowdale Brook corridor and, and Riparian corridor, so there's wetlands obviously along the stream there, which is this linear kind of feature here that separates the land along Haggis Parkway from the center of the site and the grandstands and um, in the track area. And then there's um, some wetlands along the eastern edge and then within the outer track. It's hard to see, but this kind of C-shaped wetland feature is within the outer track, between the outer track and the inner track. Um, and those total about five acres. Um, there's two kind of more significant vernal pools within the core area. One is um, man-made based on our wetland scientists review. Um, it's outside of other wetland areas. It's uh, just west of Willowdale Brook. It's this red spot here. Um, and it's right along the what was the haul road that um, hauled material from the ponds, what are now ponds along Highest Parkway to the center of the down site to, to build the track and, and the facility there. So there's a pool there that would be regulated more by Army Corps than DEP given its man-made classification. And then um, another wet vernal pool system uh, up between the Scrubber Downs Road and this other access drive that's it's right in here, sort of northwest of the outer track. Um, and that one's a naturally occurring vernal pool. 
Another component of our site inventory analysis is infrastructure. Um, and like I said, we did a conceptual infrastructure plan about a year and a half ago. This is certainly a lot has changed and evolved. Um, so there's all the major utilities that border this planning area along Haggis Parkway. Um, there now is all those major utilities, water, sewer, electric, communications, fiber optics. That's being installed on phase one. So coming up from Route 1 to the south, that um, can be extended into the core after master plan and, and development design. There's um, water um, and limited sewer off of Sawyer Road um, that you know, is near the site. Um, that's actually where the current sewer line extends to the grandstands, but has very limited capacity and is it's pretty old and tired. Um, so there's no real ability to use that in, in its current condition. And then along Payne Road, as part of this, the innovation district and that part of the project, infrastructure is being extended down um, and would tie into the site from the north. So the other component of this step is to, is to look at um, kind of opportunities and constraints, areas that um, are less developable and more developable, and to, to begin to rough out areas for the master plan. So there's kind of a fair amount going on on this plan. Um, we're showing, you know, obviously the existing wetlands that uh, are on site in uh, the lighter brown is the upland areas. Um, we've shown on here the white circles are uh, what we've shown on other aspects of, of the project, kind of a, <laughs> the walking distances from the center of the site. So each ring is, um, is a five minute walk. I think there's actually a two and a half minute walk in the middle. And then it goes to five, 10, 15. Um, and then some potential alignments for kind of major roads coming in from Haggis Parkway um, to connect the site to that, uh, that street, coming through the site, connecting up to the innovation district in general terms, connecting down to, to phase one, um, and then areas for kind of key intersections and activities. We're also beginning to kind of rough out places for trails. Trails in the open space greenway systems are a pretty big deal for this project, and we've been thinking about it all along and want to continue that from phases one and two into the core so that those, those areas have good connections and have good, good, good linkages. In terms of staff comments, uh, we wanted to be responsive to that and to be a, more, a bit more illustrative on the sort of the less suitable development areas, more suitable development areas. Um, so in orange is, is really the kind of the, where we see the more intense development occurring, um, kind of less constrained by wetlands and natural resources. Um, I mean, given the scale of, of this project in general, um, we haven't, at this stage of the site inventory, we haven't come up with a sort of definitely develop, developable, um, definitely conservation. So we have these yellow areas that are certainly less suitable for development. Large areas of them will, will be conservation, um, but there could be areas where there's modest development. So um, it's at this phase, before we get into master plan, we felt it was kind of premature to establish hard and fast conservation areas and development areas. So we're framing it as less suitable, certainly, and more suitable. In terms of um, the open space percentage uh, in the zone, 10% is required. Um, certainly at least more than 20% will be provided in the core. Um, the exact figure we really need to kind of work with the board on through master plan and, and individual subdivisions um, as we kind of get into more details in terms of where development is going to happen. Um, the grandstands uh, was a was a, a comment it's in that the town doesn't see it as a historic structure, but the state um, thinks it ha certainly has historic value. Um, we're taking that pretty seriously and have been from the start um, and are currently 
working with an architect to study potential potential retrofits of of the grandstand um, over time should the track operation you know not begin to not use it at all right right now there's limited use of the the grandstand building uh, on derby day and a few other occasions um, but we're looking at retrofit opportunities um, we're kind of far from determining whether it definitely um, is going to be um, a viable uh, thing to pursue or not, but we're heavily invested in figuring that out. And so there's, there's certainly potential that it, that it can be a fixture in the project, but it also is significant investment to figure that out. So um, it's, it's certainly not a commitment. <laughs> the partners sit in the, in the audience, um, but we're, we're trying to find a way. Um, and I think another staff comment, and I skipped by it, was making sure we show all the zoning uh, adjacencies around the site. And I did an earlier slide where um, sort of at a high level, residential zones abut the core uh, planning district from on the east, sort of a mix of residential two, village residential four, um, and I think a maybe a sliver of RF, or that might just be a budding innovation district. So it's, it's, I think it's primarily the village residential four district that abuts the, the core to the east, and then um, to, the, to the west is the Highest Parkway zoning district, and to um, the northwest is the business three, so a commercial zone. Uh, the project um, in Highest Parkway abuts the, the site to the south. So. Um, that's what we have at this point for the for this first step on the on the site inventory analysis. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Um, let's kind of throw this one out. Does anyone actually? I'll start. I have a quick question. Yeah. It's on the um, intersection plan, and I don't know if this is just it's actually already up there. There's one potential street connection that I don't see a street intersecting it. Is that just kind of Maybe down the road, so, might be utilized, or yeah, I think that's really that's right next to the the grandstand. So that was kind of symbolizing a, a potential focal point okay. um, and potential intersection to the grandstand stay. Um, so it there's a, a fu fuzzy circle that seemed to make sense in that location given the the level we're at right now. Sure, um, and then just for a refresher. Uh, abutting you in that VR4 district, mm -hmm. um, just off of Sawyer Road. There, there's conservation land in there, is that correct? So there, no. yeah. You're gonna need a refresher, clearly. Rocky's shaking his head no. Well, down in this area, more abutting to phase one residential area, the single family neighborhood that's under construction. In this area, there's state conservation land. Um, south of... That's R2. That's R2. South of, north of the R2, south of the um, um, the neighborhood there, Sawgrass neighborhood. I think there are open spaces conservation. So there is a pocket of both R2 and VR4 um, conservation right in this area. If that's where you're thinking. And, and then if you go to the VR4 area, that's all private. Up here, my understanding is this is all private, but to the east of it, there is Warren Woods. So. The innovation district, a bit north of where we're talking about, abuts mm -hmm. Warren Woods. Okay. Um, I think this is privately held. Mr. Chair, if I might, part of that land would be subject to a subdivision that's later on the, on I, the uh, I realize that. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> wanted to know if, um, and of course, we're far ways out, um, if interconnection has been discussed or has been thought about um, between that. But, I think we're a little ways out on that. Okay. Uh, does anyone else on the board have anything to add to this? Yeah, Roger. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. Um, and it pertains to the historical context here. Yeah. Um, I understand your desire to try and do something with the grandstand. What, what's the story with the race tr racetrack? The racetrack is a trickier, not to say the grandstand is not tricky. Um, I would say the, the track surface 
is, well, in the short term, and, and could be mid-range, the track's being used. So the track is active. Um, they're racing frequently like they always have been on the track. Should uh, the racing operation not continue uh, years in the future, um, we're anticipating that the majority of the track would be developed in some kind, in, in some way, rather. Um, so the, in terms of longer term um, preservation, if you will, the grandstand has been more of a focus than the track, just given its potential for reuse. Um, my, uh, pertaining to the, those two items there, does the, uh, this is for staff, I guess, does, um, does the town, can the town override the state's classification of um, historical, you know, features or structures? So I think the state has just identified it as a historic um, or potential historic structure or structure of interest. <coughs> they don't have, in my understanding, any sort of regulatory authority over the preservation of it. Um, and as I believe it was Jamel mentioned, it's not on our local town right, yeah. historic preservation list. So I think, you know, given these standards of our ordinance, it's worth a discussion. Is there, I think as the applicants indicated, you know, what opportunities are, are there? Um, but I don't believe that the state has sort of the authority, as I said, to require it. And I'll um, defer to others who might know more on that. It's, it's my understanding that the National Historical Preservation Act is actually a federal standard and that there are some requirements associated with that. So it's not just a state override. It's actually, it does have federal standing. So I would, I would recommend that we seek some legal analysis. But that, um, did you say that the state was just sort of eyeing it as a, a something of historic significance? It's not technically on the, um, it's not. The historic uh, it's register, not, uh, right? No, it's not. Okay. Um, and that's where we're at the stage where you know we need state and federal permits. Army Corps of Engineers would, you know, is already permitting the project. So, um, you know, out of interest of the project, we're looking at the feasibility of retrofitting it and yeah. seeing if it's viable. We're also doing that. Um, you know, to, to show due diligence with the state and federal government should we not be able to, to save it um, and it, it be redeveloped. So um, there's other ways, too, at uh, memorializing its historical integrity that doesn't include saving it. So um, I don't, at this stage, we don't see it as a requirement by state agencies, um, but we're not really at that stage to be in detailed conversations about it. So, so in other words, this, are you saying the state does not have the grandstand and the racetrack on some list somewhere? Is it historical? Correct. They see it as it has a historical historic. value, but it's not on the historic list or register at the state level or the federal level. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. Uh, there are two waiver requests just for the board oh, yeah. Um, yeah. that I'd like all of you to weigh in on. Uh, Robin, you did have something you wanted to yeah, hit first. Go. After the waiver, though. Okay. Do you want to weigh in? Yep. With sure. It? sure. Um, I I would not <clears throat> oppose a groundwater hydrology waiver, uh, considering that there is no on-site private subsurface wastewater or well water proposed. Um, I I have I admittedly haven't gone back to the hyd groundwater hydrology regulation to to ensure that that was the only intent. So I'd have to look to staff to see if there is any other intent associated with the groundwater hydrology. But I am not, I'm not inclined to, to go with the exceptional tree specimens because even though we, you know, part of it has been cleared, there's still some, um, a significant amount of wetlands there that uh, there could be some, some tree specimens to inventory. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Yeah, I, I think I'm with Robin. Um, I have no problem with the waiver on the groundwater hydrology. Um, while a good specimens are not likely, um, given the amount of, of the previous clearing, I don't think we can rule them out. 
in, in 500 acres, there's quite possibly some areas <clears throat> that folks haven't had a chance to, to take a look at. So um, at this point, I would say no on the, uh, on the waiver for the tree specimens. Rick Meinking. I don't know much about hydrology, so I'll go with what the colleagues uh, recommend. Um, I suppose just doing a, a quick inventory just to make sure so we can check it off the list wouldn't be a bad thing. So I'd be inclined to, to want to see some tree specimens, uh, at least to walk through and identify. Thank you. Jen? I, uh, I concur. Same. Roger? Uh, I basically uh, concur also because uh, I don't think they're going to find many tree specimens on the site. So I think you have your answer there. Um, <laughs> Robin, you had another point you would like to bring up? I did. Um, <clears throat> a couple, actually. Um, I guess, um, you know, it's sort of along the same lines as the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, and I know you looked at beginning with habitat maps, which are on the state level. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that there was a lot of what they called bunny money in this area for New England cottontail. And I wonder if there is New England cottontail habitat and or uh, sightings in this area kind of a thing. I, I didn't see necessarily um, a list um, to the um, U.S. or state um, um, regarding New England cottontail habitat. Along the same line, um, the Natural Resource Protection Act, um, I, I, I think... Um, one lost protected natural resource, especially in Scarborough, is prime farmland. Um, and that is a map that you can get from the USDA, which is right down here on Route 1, kind mm -hmm. of a thing from the NRCS office. I'd just like to, to know that the land has been screened for, like I asked before, for other phases for prime farmland. <laughs> and it's just um, a quick call to Wayne Monroe at that office. Um, and, it, and it is subject to um, protection just like wetlands are and um, other water bodies. Um, I'm also wondering, I guess, what the mitigating, Im what, how impacts will be mitigated or what your approach is going to be for both vernal pools and impacts to Willowdale Brook. Sure. Um. Concurrent with this stage with the planning board, we're doing a similar stage with DEP and Army Corps. So we're working um, working with them on a long-term long permit approach, which will be very similar to your master plan, so the next stage after this. Um, and part of that is going to include sort of the initial kind of wetland permitting approach, um, and then it's going to have a framework for how we anticipate wetland permitting occur in the future. So um, at Army Corps in particular, but also DEP, they don't let you, um, and it's probably for good reason to kind of permit um, too speculatively in terms of wetlands too speculatively. So we can't do a, a whole plan that actually gets approved for this entire site, but we're going to have a framework plan that we would um, also provide the planning board that shows kind of priority conservation areas, wetland areas that we anticipate impacting, um, just sort of given their Great. isolated nature, and then areas where there's kind of compensation and mitigation involved. Um, so that's that's a step that we're not quite ready not quite for. there. Yeah, and then as far as your 10% set aside for open space network is um, Is that primarily going to be wetlands or do you plan to have any upland set aside in the open space? Requirement? Um, well in terms of upland open space just given the style of the project we anticipate that to be um, Well, we anticipate having some programmed upland open space, you know, like parks and greenways, like I would call it more developed open space. And then um, we anticipate having some upland conservation um, where it's in particular uh, beneficial to vernal pool habitat. So that's our, from an upland standpoint, that's been our focus is vernal pool habitat. 
Do we have any other questions from the board regarding the site inventory and analysis? And um, we have two more cleanup items here. Uh, one is we forgot to offer this for public comment. So if there's anyone here who would like to speak on this. No? Okay. So we'll close that. Um, and then also I just want to take the temperature on uh, the board for a workshop for the uh, master uh, phase portion of this. We've done this in the past with the other phases and quite honestly I think it's worked really well. Um, it's quite a meaty project and really, you know, it's one that deserves, a, you know, a good amount of our attention at, at one chunk of time. So I, I'm all in favor of it. Uh, I don't know how, yeah, yeah some nodding heads. So I think we'd like to work in that. I think too, the applicant has probably enjoyed those sessions. Well, maybe not enjoyed, but <laughs> you've <laughs> enjoyed more than, than some of these. Yes, so. Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next up is R.J. Grondin and Sons request an update on the Larrabee Farm Mitigation Project for 281 Beach Ridge Road, Assessor's Map R13, Lot 7. Jay, I believe you're on deck. Yeah, um, I just want to provide the board a little bit of uh, background. I know the applicants narrative did a pretty good job, and I believe he has a presentation that he's uh, prepared to go through tonight as well. So just to sort of bring the board up to speed, this is a uh, property that is subject to a contract zone agreement that was adopted in uh, 2006 and then amended just a few years later in 2008. Uh, to recently come to the, um, the current manager of the property uh, as well as staff that there are currently some compliance issues with regards to timing that are spelled out in the contract zone as I spelled out my memo really around um, when the site is to be um, basically completed and conveyed to the town as well as when the aggregate work that was approved, um, this is materials processing um, and storage and such was supposed to be completed. Um, and so um, those are certainly some elements that are going to need to get addressed and we'll probably this form be working with the town council in the coming months on those contract zone updates. Um, but as we looked at what the contract zone language currently had in place, one of the sort of provisions is around reporting to the planning board. And so we really felt this was a good place to, so we can all start with a baseline of information. Where are we? What's happened? What's going on on the site? Um, and so I think that's really what we're here tonight to hear from. Um, what's been happening? And where do we go from here? There's no action anticipated by the board this evening other than to note that, you know, really our next step is going to be the joint hearing with the Thank you, Jay. Would you like to introduce yourself? And yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Larry Gronin with IJ Gronin Sons. Uh, thank you for the time tonight. I'm also here with uh, Heather Stolazi Wards, who's with uh, Boyle Associates, who's been involved with this project from literally day one uh, back in the early 2000s. So, uh, Jay, you pretty much took my whole presentation, so I'm, I'm almost done. So, uh, no, just kidding. Uh, on a serious note, um, we are here just really just for uh, an update to the board uh, and also to kind of quickly go over the, the history of the project as I'm sure probably most of you are not real familiar with it or if you are, um, not a whole lot. Um, so I've tried to keep tonight's presentation pretty short, pretty kind of 30,000 feet. Um, if we want to dive into the weeds, we certainly can. That's why Heather's here. Um, I've been involved with the um, operation uh, as far as the operations side and a little less on the permitting side initially um, and then the last four or five years uh, on the, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So, um, so through my letter that I sent in late May and um, Jay's letter that he sent in early June, I think that kind of um, goes through, uh, you know, hits the highlights of the project, um, but I, I just wanted to, real quick, uh, this, this map is just showing um, Scarborough's existing town-owned uh, conservation, uh, and in the red is our project. So you can see it kind of it augments, you know, what's already in, in place in the town. So 
um, you know, I think it kind of rounds out that corner of the world. Just wanted to see how that kind of all fits in in the grand, grand picture there. Um, so quickly to summarize, the, the property is 337 acres. A lot, you know, 95 acres was existing wetlands. There's over a mileage of frontage on, along the Nonsuch River. Um, so, you know, when this project is done, that'll all be uh, in conservation and undeveloped. Um, so uh, that's, uh, I know that f looks favorably in, the, in the, the town's eyes. Historic use was farming, forestry, um, you know, mineral extraction recently in recreation. Um, so I just wanted to spend some time on the, the, the history and the timeline of, of this project. So um, some of the initial talks with the town literally were in the early 2000s. Um, and then I think permitting like in 2004. And so the original contract zone was in 2006. Um, and then basically we immediately got to work uh, with different projects, um, with the mineral extraction, um, with uh, various wetlands projects. So right off the bat, we had um, one in 2006 for the Gorham Bypass, which was a very big project. Uh, we created 15 acres of, of wetlands out of an old sand pit that was uh, basically left unreclaimed for decades, uh, from what I understand. And then there's a bunch of uh, associated preservation uplands slash wetlands around each project. Um, Cabela's also uh, the following year, that was I think around four or five acres of actual creation and then a bunch of preservation around it again. Um, then in 2008, um, so the, the original uh, contract zone didn't really allow for us to, to haul material in. Um, so a lot of it was we couldn't really make a lot of the, the materials to specifications that we needed. So we came back with an amendment to be able to come in and process and, you know, so like part of the property was a, a, a relatively small rock quarry, but we really needed sand to blend it with it, for example. Uh, and there was a few different, you know, things like that. So came back for an amendment with the board and we said, look, if, if you let us do this, then that'll help speed up, um, you know, the whole project. Because uh, part of creating the wetlands is um, a good part of the area is in some of the previously mined um, spots uh, on the property. So, um, so by doing that, we, uh, we said, well, if you, if you let us do that, we'll try to condense the project. Uh, so, so back in 06, we had a 20 year agreement with the town and then we said well we'll try to get it down to 10 uh, if, if you let us do that and that was a negotiation back then so that's that's what we did uh, 2009 had another uh, creations project uh, that was a huge preservation small creation project uh, and then uh, um, our last one that we built was back in 2012 so as far as the creation areas it's been pretty quiet um, and now we're, we've been doing it so long that we're now getting final sign-offs because uh, every single project has a 10-year uh, monitoring program with it to just make sure that it's doing what it's designed to do. Um, so, and if there's any little bumps in the road, we, uh, it's literally monitored every year uh, and Boyle Associates does that. It's sent to the town, it's sent to uh, Maine DEP, it's sent to U.S. Army Corps. Um, it's really intense for the first five years and then it's a little looser assuming everything's going well. Uh, then on the 10th year you can file for a final report and a closeout and basically it says yes you've, you've done that. So, um, so our first th uh, two projects have uh, final final sign off from, from all the authorities uh, and then we're waiting for one this year as well um, for the jet port. Uh, and then, of course, the one from 2012 were only seven years in. So, um, so through um, some turnover, A, on the town level and um, internally in our company, um, we overlooked the 2018 kind of deadline. And so it was brought to our attention just recently. So me and Jay talked and said, well, what's, what's the best way to do this? So. Um, and then my final point is we'd already started as far as the, you know, the, the aggregate processing stuff because all the, most of the native material is, is, is done as far as um, extracting um, except for really just the floor where uh, we're working. 
Um, so there, there was a rock quarry there, like I said. Um, and that's played out. Uh, we're in the process of, of getting that re reclaimed. Um, some of it's done already. Um, and we'd already, in January, we started stop taking in, you know, things to be recycled and, and whatnot, because we did some, uh, some recycling there as part of our operations. So we'd already started um, kind of winding that down. So basically, so talking to Jay, so kind of our request is, um, you know, maybe by the end of the season we can kind of, or certainly next spring, have, have all that stuff done. Um, and then wanted to look at, um, it'd be nice to, to finish out this project as far as the, the, the wetlands creation area. Um, as noted in my, um, as noted in my uh, paper is two thirds, of, about two thirds of it is, um, has been created the way and, and closed out as a creation and preservation project. So, um, so, you know, 200 and some odd acres out of, out of 330. So, so that was kind of the other leg to the stool is could we get an extension on that as far as, you know, we'll wind down our operations, but it'd be nice to, to be able to truly close out this, um, this plan the way it was originally envisioned, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so that brings me to basically my final slide. So the areas in orange um, are the, the remaining areas that have not um, been a, a wetlands creation area. Um, so if you go back to the very first, oops, sorry about that. So you can see everything that's outlined on this opening slide has been developed, built, and three out of the four projects are, you know, done, 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 monitoring everything. It was built, uh, it was functioning as designed. Um, and then, so this final slide is basically just showing the, it's about 17 acres of creation area. Uh, it's total about a, just over 100 acres if, uh, if you included uh, the preservation and creation. Um, so um, that's kind of where we're at as far as the project. Um, the, one of the stipulations in the contract zone was that there would be more regular um, updates to this board, and that did fall through the cracks, so we apologize. Um, and that was a combination of turnover and, and whatever else. So we did want to try to get back up to speed. Um, there has been regular communication with the town, uh, but just not on this level, like all the monitoring reports that we get. Uh, we've, we've copied the town. Um, so there has been regular communication in that sense. So I just did, I did want to make that clear. So um, that's about it. This is one of the vernal pools that we created. It's one of the, I don't know if a vernal pool's ever been created other than this site in the state of Maine. So uh, my understanding is vernal pools have been tried to be made, but they were not successful. So these are mm -hmm. active producing vernal pools that were created. So it's kind of neat. Anyway, <laughs> so you have a long night. Any questions? I just have one quick question. So um, the only thing that's missing is the reporting to the planning board. You all have continued to contract with Boyle and Associates and maintain right. the appropriate requirements associated with all the Army Corps permits and the like. The only dot that wasn't, the I that wasn't dotted was coming here to talk to us. On a regular basis. On a regular right. basis. Yep. And then um, on one of your slides, there's a river very close by. Is that the Nunsuch River sure that is, goes yes. right by? Yep. Excellent. Thanks. Yep. Right at the bottom of the map, that's all the Nunsuch. So, um, and we've actually, part of the project, uh, we even used some of uh, Scarborough Fish and Games property that was basically mm -hmm. useless to them. And so um, for a lot of, of none such, both sides are conserved. Great. And, and have, you, have you had to take any water quality sampling um, from some of the wells? What was it within Yes, a... and that was one of Dan's comments. Okay. So yes, as soon, as soon, literally as soon as we got um, approval back in mid-2006, yeah. Uh, we got right to work on doing all the pre-blast surveys. We okay. took all those samples. I have a list this long, a book this thick, uh, with, with all that data. So if, But if it I, hasn't been summarized in a table or anything like that, all yep. the data? No, it I has? can certainly okay. forward that to, the, yeah, that would to, be great. to Dan or whoever great. would like to see it. 
So that was the very first thing we did, basically. Right. Well, we look forward to seeing you again at some yes, point. Yes, likewise. Um, if I could just jump on um, Sean's point, that was certainly one of the things that jumped to my mind when this came mm -hmm. across my desk that we were out of compliance with. And, oh boy, what, what's going on? It, but it's, it's been great to realize that everything else in the, that was supposed to be happening out there has been happening and has been very successful. Um, so really, it is there's, there was an administrative hiccup and we started to talk to him internally about how we can get better at our tracking for this project. But I think we're, you know, we're, that was one of the very things that was very pleasant to see is that, good, the important elements, the artwork, the creation, the preservation, that all is going relatively important. And if I may, are there any other, um, it would be nice to know, I'm not going to put you on the spot, if there are any other wetland mitigation projects like this in town, because Scarborough is, I, I thought there was one out on Highland Avenue, but I, that might be that might be South Portland. I think it's just over the South Portland line, out by uh, Layton Farms, past Layton Farm area on Highland Ave. Is that what that's called, Layton? No, Layton's up there. Uh, so nope, was. it's where they have the underdrained soil filter that doesn't always work. Oh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Sorry. This, we have a Which works summary. great. <laughs> we have a summary of kind of what's around, um, and I, I can present that to the board as well. Um, but I don't, I can't think, I think you're thinking of some conservation land, but not per se a wetlands creation area. Um, so like I said, there's still 17 acres of, of creation here as well as another hundred and some odd preservation around that. Um, and just to kind of reiterate, you know, the, the first, uh, agreement in 2006 was for 20 years, so it would have been 2026. We started the amendment in 07, got it in early 08, and we all know what happened in late 08. And then, <laughs> so, you know, we kind of envisioned this happening faster, and then the economy went south, and hold on to your hat. So, uh, you know, if it was still 07 right through, we probably would have had this all done by now, but. So that's kind of the other, some of the other reasons for um, asking for, you know, and one thought was, well, maybe you just go back to the 2026 date, you know, as far as just the wetlands piece, not, not per se the, the operations. As far as our operations, you know, we, before, even before all this came up, as far as our, our timing with the, with the agreement, um, my goal was to have it done, you know, by the end of the season. Um, so just wanted to throw that out. Thank you very much. Appreciate yes. the uh, information. Uh, just as a point of order, we're supposed to have public comment on this item. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this? No. Seeing none, all right, I'm going to close public comment. Roger? Yeah, just, just a quick question. So you, uh, your, your outfit owns all the land, is that correct? Yes, yes we do. And so what happens to the land once you finish this off and you've yep. got the wetlands identified? So what, what do you envision happening with that land? So when this, yeah, so it's written right in the contract. So when this project is complete, uh, it'll be deeded over to the town, likely the Scarborough Land Trust. All the, all the land? All of it. Okay. Yep, and there's uh, a, a bunch of restrictions on it, so there's not a whole lot you can do as far as development. Uh, there's really no development you can do any. Um, it's really just for preservation and, you know, light recreational use, um, no motorized vehicles, which... That's tough, but you know we'll attempt. Uh, but there'll be some, there'll be some. There's a few paths already built, um, but a lot of it, you know, it's still an active site, so you know that hasn't been completed yet. But yeah, so the the end game is this will be uh, in conservation in perpetuity, and it'll be given to the town. Okay. Yeah. Actually, if I could just jump in on that, I believe there was already one 50 acre plus or minus. Piece That's correct. Given to the town, um, the original one. Was the original wetlands yep. creation piece. So the piece that yep. you looked at the map originally, all the way on the right hand side, has already been uh, granted to the town as it's in its conservation easement. So yep. um, that provision of the contract zone has been happened. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you very much for the update. Thank you. We'll be seeing you in uh, a little while, I suppose, with the council. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Next item is uh, Michael Scammon requests a site inventory and analysis review for 39 Ingersoll Drive, Assessor's Map R50, Lot 24. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So another site inventory and analysis review. Um, this one 
It is located in the Highgate Parkway in rural farming districts. It shares the same driveway as the Salt Pump Climbing Gym. Uh, there's that, this applicant was last before the board in April uh, for a sketch plan review, as you may recall. And again, uh, the board should be sure to determine if the information provides a clear understanding of the site and identifies opportunities and constraints that will guide the utilization of the site. Um, so staff, again, has found that the applicant has generally satisfied the requirements. Um, the applicant should discuss the areas that are unsuitable for development and discuss how these areas will be utilized going forward. And the applicant should also discuss the type of proposed development in the Hygus Parkway zone and RF zoning districts and how they will potentially interplay with each other. And that's all I have. Thanks, Jamil. If uh, the applicant would like to introduce himself and please speak to some of the highlighted items from the uh, staff on this. Uh, good evening, um, Mr. Chair. My name is Bob Metcalf. I'm with Mitchell Associates, and I'm just trying to hook up this PowerPoint today. Plug in the right unit here, Jamil. I believe so. I can try to unplug mine. Just not coming up. It's just taking a while to open up. Well, while this is coming up, I'll please start into it. You've all received the uh, site analysis booklet that we put together describing all the conditions on the site uh, to address the site analysis information. As Jamal said, we were here back in April and kind of gave you kind of a workshop run through of uh, the property itself and what the overall intent is to create a wellness campus uh, on the, uh, the, the existing facility, which was primarily a gravel pit operation. Uh, there were. The site in itself entirety is 49, uh, almost 49.89 acres, of which uh, about 40 some odd acres of that was the actual gravel operation uh, on site. Uh, and I'll go to Jamal's comments first, and then I'll go back to that other item in there uh, regarding the site analysis, highlight opportunities and constraints. We have gone through that section, and I'll try and bring that up. Uh, I think when we went through this whole thing, and I guess I started looking at the report that I gave out, and there's an awful lot of information on there, including an awful lot of written text that I think describes what some of those comments were and what's missing information that I think is actually in there. Uh, perhaps maybe what we need to do is try and extract, extrapolate some of that and actually put it on a map. But the documentation is in the booklet describing what the existing site conditions are in terms of the gravel uh, conditions underneath. Uh, it describes the, uh, the vegetation on site and it gets into the historic parameters of the site. The only thing historic out there is, is an old family cemetery that's located on site. Uh, the vegetation itself, this is pretty much an entirely disturbed site between the gravel extraction oper operations that occurred over time. Uh, the vegetation that's coming back is more of a successional growth, uh, everything from an herbaceous ground layer of grasses and weeds, if you will, to some shrub materials starting to integrate, and then there are existing trees that have come back in and, and populated certain areas along the perimeter of the property near the adjacent abutting uses. 
there is some existing <coughs> vegetation, but it's not a, a, a significant vegetation complex that would have significant trees worth preserving, but obviously along the perimeter, the intent is to preserve as much of that buffering as the development moves forward. As we said the last time we were in, that we were just looking for uh, doing a phase one uh, right now for the, de for the development. <laughs> okay. I had technical difficulties the last time we did this. Here we go. Here we go. So in terms of the site context plan that we put together, the site, as you can see, is located here uh, along Higus Parkway. The actual street address is on Ingleside Drive, which runs along uh, parallel to Higus Parkway that has access to uh, the property itself. The salt pump house uh, climbing gym is located in this location here. Uh, the uh, gateway uh, uh, residential development is located in here. Uh, the golf pro shop is uh, over here. Cabela's is located in this corner here. This is the Irving and then the, uh, the truck complex over here, the main turnpike. And then almost directly across from where the entrance is to the salt pump is where the access to this project would be. And that's where I believe you got a fitness uh, center that's under construction on the opposite side. And then of course Route 1 is down on this end here. Uh, one of the comments I know uh, that Jamal had made was the fact that we hadn't, didn't have the zoning covered in here uh, on the plans. We had actually shown the zoning on our zoning assessment map, which basically addressed the zoning on site. So we've added this and we will update the plan to accommodate, accommodate for it. Oops, excuse me. This is the one slide that keeps rotating on me. So primarily the majority of the site is in the Higgins Parkway uh, district. And then there's a small area it's in the rural uh, farming district. Uh, you have the Higgins Parkway zone along the other side. There's a contract zone that abuts onto the, uh, the northerly side. So this was the overall plan that we had started initially discussing with you the last time we were here, uh, showing the existing ponds associated with the gravel extraction op operation, uh, including uh, showing there's another pond on the opposite side of the property. Uh, that belongs to Three Diamonds, which is also part of a, an extraction operation in the area. The access right now for the curb cut is in this location in here, which goes to Salt Pump, and it would also be the same access coming in to serve uh, the development of this property itself, which is part of what the DOT's curb cut assignments were when the Higgins Parkway was constructed. This is just a, uh, an overall survey plan showing the, uh, the extents of the property itself. Uh, in this location down in here is a 3.89 acre out parcel, which is actually Mr. Scammon's residence. Uh, it is not included in the overall uh, development parcel itself. Uh, on this end of the property, there's a right of way that extends out to two rod you know, section in here. There are four existing residential lots that are not part of this development that have access over this right of way. And then this roadway here pretty much follows along what was part of the active gravel extraction operation. So it's more of a tow road coming through. And the cemetery we were talking about is located on a knoll area up in this location in here. So this area is just to give you kind of an assessment of what's on the ground right now. Uh, where you can see where the ponds are and where the salt gym is. Uh, this is pretty much uh, a very uh, condition of open and wooded areas, and I'll get in that with some of the assessment. These are the four lots we were talking about. There's a residence, um, these two here, and then over in this location in here. As you can see, there are other residential uses along the, this uh, westerly side of the property. And then what falls off the, the map on this side is the gateway. And then this portion here was previously owned by the state and folks are actually reviewing it now for a, uh, another type of, I think it's a warehouse use uh, that is this parcel that completely fronts along the uh, Higgins Parkway portion of the property itself. And on this one, again, we were talking about the zoning. 
the green on this is showing the rural uh, farming uh, district. And then what's in the beige shows the, uh, the highest parkway zone. In the upper corners, what you're looking at here with the blue is the uh, aquifer protection overlay district, uh, which shows coming in along this outer reach, goes off site here, comes along underneath the parcel I just talked about along Highgus Parkway, and obviously around where the, the gravel extraction operations are located. As part of that aquifer protection zone, when we start looking at this from the master planning phase and also for phase one, uh, part of our design, and we've discussed this in the previous one, it's critical that we'll be looking at dealing with uh, some of the newer technology in terms of stormwater management to address water quality and quantity on site. So those elements will be looked at in terms of the overall future development phases of the project itself. <coughs> and I won't get into the, the whole analysis part on here. Uh, this is more, really gets into the zoning and then uh, gets in a little more detail in terms of what we're talking about as far as the uh, the hydrology and the aquifer protection district. So I think that gives the, the narrative in terms of what we understand of the site and where the opportunities are and the constraints we need to look at protecting. So on this one, uh, this is the soils assessment of the site. Primarily, as you can see, what's in the beige area in here is all identified as gravel pit extraction. Uh, on this portion of the site where we have the uh, in the residential or the rural farming district, uh, they're primarily a Hinkley and a, a Lyman Tunbridge, and they're both a loamy, sandy, gravelly mixed type of soils uh, in this area here. And then we get a little bit of the, uh, the Hinkley down in this back corner uh, on the perimeter of the extraction area where it has not been disturbed at this point. And then we have, um, <laughs> excuse me, and then we have another more of a, a uh, sandy type material down in this location here. And then what's in the green actually falls primarily on uh, Mr. Scammon's residential parcel itself. So the soils overall are fairly well draining as is somewhat apparent by the nature of the gravel extraction operation that's gone on here. There are areas in the site which are shallow to bedrock. Uh, and in some of the areas through the gravel extraction operation, you can see where some of the gravel has been exposed. Uh, and actually in some of the areas you can actually see the glacial striations where the glaciers actually moved over uh, the ledge in this area. And uh, so that uh, you can see that inf that level of detail on the areas where the extraction has occurred. So. And the next couple of pages that are in your document really just get into all the criteria and the classifications of the various soil regimes that are on the site. And, uh, they're really not a limiting factor in terms of the ability to do anything on site. In fact, because it was a gravel operation, because of the ledge, it actually offers, offers the opportunity to be able to utilize on-site materials in the construction process for constructing of the roadways. Uh, uh, ledge removal can be utilized in terms of producing some crushed gravel for the, prop, for the site itself. And then in locations where it's a shallow uh, to bedrock situation, buildings, we can actually construct over the ledge, pin it to the ledge. So it's, it provides opportunities in both realms in the sense of being able for constructability as well as materials to use on site. Uh, for the vegetation complex on here, there are three criteria that we put on here. The darker of the green is a complex where we have evergreen species that are on site, which are primarily in the pines and some spruce and fir. And then we have deciduous uh, complexes, which is limited to the sum that's coming up and around the outer edges of the pond area and along the perimeter. And then the lighter green that you see on here, which is a significant amount of the site, is really where the more of the successional growth material is occurring, which is primarily grasses, mosses, some small shrub materials that are starting to come back in, and then some successional trees uh, that are popping up uh, throughout the uh, previously disturbed areas. I want to point out on the hydrology as far as the, the ponds are concerned, you'll see that there are three blue color, colors that form around the pond itself. Uh, the blue on the outer perimeter reflects what the seasonal high water would be in most of the, in these ponds. The next one in is what is the mean water level for the ponds and then the darker blue in the inner core is what the seasonal low water marks usually are. It averages between a three to four foot plus or minus foot elevation change between seasonal high volume of water in the pond and when the ponds recede down. 
in this one pond in this area, which Mike Chris is not finding, uh, which is referred to as the mother's pond, and I'm just going to go to this screen here. It uh, is located in this corner here, which is a small area that was excavated as part of the gravel operation, but that one tends to dry, actually dry up during the, uh, during the season, uh, and that's one area that we had discussed that being incorporated in part of the phase one development. So. And this goes into more of a description on the vegetation complex, the successional growth patterns that we've experienced on the site, and then the hydrology and the drainage. And I'm going to go back to the question on the drainage. Right now, the majority of the water ultimately winds down and goes through a drainage way that outlets through here and then heads over towards uh, the gateway and then ultimately out towards Cabela and, uh, and onward. Uh, it is slowly metered out. It isn't a complete discharge of constant flow, uh, high volume flow. The uh, site does fall within the Millbrook uh, watershed uh, uh, catchment area. And as I said earlier, when we were talking about the uh, aquifer protection area and stormwater, part of the whole premise on this is to dealing with the on-site stormwater treatment as far as quality and quantity. Uh, so that's being taken very seriously in terms of how the development of this site addresses all that and uh, does not impact on the, uh, the watershed itself. And then on here, we're talking about site circulation as discussed, the fact that it is a uh, priorly active gravel operation. Uh, we're looking at means of how we can actually take advantage of where some of the access roads actually went through the site and being able to incorporate those into design, primarily since most of them fall along the edges of the pond itself. Uh, we're looking at how to integrate that circulation pattern into what will be the core of the phase one. And then we've shown preliminarily uh, how we would have ultimate connection that would come back out towards Two Rod Road as part of the future phase development. All the and then also there's the connection down to, to Mr. Scammon's property. Uh, there's a potential for a complete loop back around to come back up into this area. Whether it's roadway development, there are also opportunities for pedestrian uh, connectivity. Uh, that's one of the real primary focuses of this whole wellness campus is not only to minimize the interior need for vehicular circulation, but obviously for access and public safety purposes we will but how we can integrate some trails and uh, pathways that will actually tie all of the elements of what will be the master development plan for this project over the, uh, over the life of the project itself. Again, this would be the primary access coming in off of Higus Parkway. It would be a shared uh, with the salt pump uh, house climbing gym. It would access across through between the two ponds in this location in here. And then I'll be showing you a sketch later on that you'd seen before in terms of what we're looking at as far as development is concerned. Uh, utilities would all be coming in from Higus Parkway uh, through this cross connection in here. There also is a utility easement that was reserved that runs along the westerly side of the salt pump house uh, climbing gym that if the need were to be able to tie into utilities to serve this back portion of the site. So that is an opportunity if need be, but right now the core is looking at all the utilities primarily coming through the main entranceway where uh, the uh, utilities are accessible. And again, this just goes into more of a narrative in terms of what we're talking about as far as the site circulation, the main entrances, the interior circulation, and the utility access. And then uh, in terms of amenities, uh, obviously the ponds are a significant part of this whole property in terms of the quality of the site itself. It exhibits characters that are going to be enhanced views from Higus Parkway to the site, and then it takes an provides the opportunity for actually the creative development uh, concept for uh, the property itself, as we said, as a whole wellness campus. Uh, so the views in terms of the orientation taking into the ponds internally as well as externally. Uh, the area up in here uh, would be part of a, a future phase, so there's an opportunity to uh, utilize this material in here, as I said, for future parts of the development. This is the cemetery, which would be highlighted in terms of protection, uh, in terms of the overall layout for the site itself. 
And then again, this just gets into more of a, a bit of the history of the cemetery on the property. Uh, we go into the topography, as I mentioned, this area being a glaciated area, the gravel looks drop out from that from the glacial age and the uh, the striations and the ledge that we've seen actually experienced, we've vi viewed on site. And then again, the vegetation complex, most of it is successional. You know, there's some stuff out that has come back in that we really want to try and be able to preserve and keep that character as well as it provides a nice screening from Highest Parkway and some of the other developments that, that occurs uh, adjacent to it. So in terms of opportunities, uh, the areas around the pond, uh, provide a significant opportunity for pedestrian access and enjoyment of recreational uses. Also along the edges of the pond where some of the vegetation has come in to uh, preserve the wildlife habitat that's along the fringes. Uh, the area in this particular location where we were talking about the phase one type development where we have the ledge material, that provides an opportunity as well as a constraint in the sense that you know, it's material that we're going to have to remove, but it can be utilized on site. Um, this area up in here uh, provides an opportunity for future residential use in that zone and the uh, ability to preserve some of the, the vegetated character around that to kind of separate that ultimately from the, the phase development that would occur within the Highest Parkway zone. Um, so there's a lot of, there really are no significant constraints in terms of wetlands and vernal pools. Uh, the biggest constraint probably from an environmental standpoint is dealing with the, the aquifer protection zone itself. Uh, and Mr. Scammon's intent is he wants to, you know, restore this property and make it a really vital community asset. And so that uh, reinforcing some of the landscape is going to be critical to the overall project itself. And some of those activities would probably take place prior to some of the other phases going in just to be able to do some uh, reclamation. And this gets into just a, an overview of the opportunities and the constraints. And then this is, as we had presented before, is really the phase one plan development nucleus that we were looking at uh, where the wellness center uh, would be located in phase one with the primary access and interconnection uh, Coming through here, this is that one little pond area we're referring to that would become the mother's garden and the focus of the views from the, the wellness center and potential for additional parking as we'll come into with the, uh, the subsequent phases. And then until future development occurs, there's opportunities for pedestrian trails through the site uh, that can be utilized uh, until the subsequent phases come on. So. It'll provide a lot of opportunities. This is the concept plan that you'd seen before, uh, which is the access road coming in, the wellness center being located in here, the mother's garden we were talking about in this location in here, and then accessory use for parking in here, parking circulation around uh, in a circular format for the parking itself. Um, And that's just, I am done with that. This is the overview, and this, that footbridge is not going to happen, so I'll just to clarify that. So. All right. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we do have an opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to get up and speak? All right, I'm going to close public comment. Um, any, I'm just going to open it up. Any questions from the board regarding the site inventory and analysis we have just heard? No. Um, as I'll have a, I just have a question. Do you have any issues um, with what staff has identified as, as areas that for improvement or clarification? No, they're pretty straightforward. I think some of them are actually within the submission, but they just need to be clarified on some of the plan documents, and I'll have a conversation with Jamal about that just to okay. make sure we have the, the detail down as the way you want to have it on the plan. So, Rachel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I need a little more clarity around the mother's garden sure. and the pond because um, the the change in the water levels, you know, seasonal. That's a that's pretty dramatic change. So, how are you going to handle both the, both the the pond and the garden? I'm <laughs> having difficulty wrapping my head around that. So that's that's something that I would want to look at as you went along. 
um, and you don't necessarily have to talk about it tonight, but it's... That would be part of the phase one site plan. Yeah, and, and I would be looking for clarity around there. Sure. I, I think another area that I would start to think about is the, the potential for connectivity with other properties. Uh, and it, if not for phase one, then, then for a later phase, mm -hmm. because we do have the... Um, uh, the apartments up there that are really connected to part of uh, what you're what you're looking at developing and in, in maybe the next phase uh, so as you go along these are things that you kind of have to anticipate while you're looking mm -hmm. at the first phase for the development we also look at that and then how the whole whole parcel might look so I would just suggest that, that you start to think about that. Are there any uh, connections between the ponds other than the small one at the mother's pond? Or are they all completely independent no matter what the season? They're pretty much independent, but there's a culvert that connects on a couple of them. So, but in terms of physical, there's a physical divide in between every one of the ponds themselves. But, but there is a culvert that, that connects them? On uh, two of them, like? There is a, a culvert. Uh, Excuse me, could you approach the podium and introduce yourself for the record? Hello, Mike, Mike Scammon, 39 Ingleside Drive. Uh, explanation on the water, the ponds themselves. Um, this was a sand deposit. So underneath these ponds, are, the roadways are all a coarse sand. So. What happens is the water eventually flows underneath the roads and they all kind of settle down to the, about the same level. During the spring, the larger pond, uh, let me point that out. How do you do the 51.4 acre pond, the large one? No, it's this Push one. On that arrow. Push on the arrow. Okay, it would be that pond right there. It's the larger pond of all of them. And it receives most of, uh, the 100 or so acres up on top, the watershed that's developed up on top comes down to this pond. But what happens is there's a connection here with a culvert. Most, most of the water finds its way through the underneath. The groundwater moves uh, through the pond areas and it heads in this direction here. It's slow, but that's the flow of the water in that area. So we might have an inch or two of rain. One pond will fill up. Um, a little bit higher than others, but eventually after the course of a week or two, it finds its way through by the underground currents. So um, there's really no need of connecting each pond with culverts. And they're not, or they are? They're not. They're not, no. they're not. okay. No. That, yeah, that's, yeah. thank you. That's, that's what I wanted to establish. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I, I certainly wish you luck. This is going to be a challenging site, but I think there's some wonderful opportunities here. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Anyone else have anything to add to this? OK. All right, we'll see you at the next phase. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, just again to clarify, we do not take up new business after 10 PM. We are at 945 right now. Uh, based on what I'm seeing for our the next agenda item, I would say that the last item is probably going to be tabled until the next meeting. So if you are here for item number 14, our apologies. Um, sometimes it's the way the cookie crumbles. You will be uh, first on the list for the next agenda, though. So at least hopefully get you out of here in a reasonable hour. Again, thanks for coming, and we're really sorry about that. Um, Last item of the evening, Cottages at Sawyer LLC request a preliminary subdivision review for 98 Sawyer Road, Assessor's Map R59, Lot 8C. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this project is located in the VR4 zoning district at 98 Sawyer Road. Uh, so the applicant was before the board uh, last summer in July for a sketch plan review. And they're in front of the board tonight for a preliminary subdivision review. Uh, the proposal includes 69 lots and 93 residential units, including 61 single-family homes and 16 duplexes. So quick reminder, the VR4 zoning district standards are intended to promote the establishment of higher-density village-style development 
with an interconnected network for landscape streets, blocks, and pedestrian ways. The zoning standards seek to have sidewalks on both sides of the street within the development. However, the applicant has requested a waiver from the standard. Uh, staff suggests that the board and the applicant have a discussion about providing a sidewalk along Sawyer Road that connects to Gorham Road and or the existing sidewalk along Sawyer Road in lieu of this zoning requirement. The zoning standards uh, require development to be clustered away from wetlands and other water bodies. Uh, contiguous wetlands of 15,000 square feet or greater uh, shall be protected as open space. And the standards require a minimum 25-foot wetland buffer from the upland edge of a wetland to any building lot boundary. It appears the applicant's providing these uh, required buffers, but they should be depicted on the subdivision plan. Staff also recommends that the applicant extend the landlocked lane right-of-way to the easterly property line to enable the potential for a future connection to Gorham Road if one may be warranted. And finally, the applicant's requesting several waivers from the street acceptance ordinance, of which staff is generally comfortable with. However, the design appears to include an additional required waiver for the proposed length of the dead ends without a hammerhead turnaround that Public Works has concerns with. I'll now ask Angela to provide details of this required waiver. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's so there's a. I want to approach this in a, kind of a, a logical, organized way of some sort. There's a lot of cleanup notes in here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's five pages of staff notes uh, accompanying the submission. So I think what would be best at this hour, at this stage in the game, is for you to really highlight on areas this planning board needs to help you clarify, areas that maybe uh, you don't see IDI with staff's comments on. Um, and of course, you know, a general uh, project overview, brief as you could be, we, we do read our materials. Um, yes. So you, you can't assume that. Um, but I, I think what I'd really like to see come out of this meeting is uh, you have the right direction, you know where you're headed, and that way we're more efficient with uh, your next submission. Um, and that, that, I think that would be ideal. Okay, so, correct. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, the good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Bradstreet with Ransom Consulting, uh, the civil engineer on this project. The uh, survey was provided by Ross uh, Land Surveying, wetlands by Dale, Dale Brewer. The uh, project that you see off of Sawyer Road um, and the plan up on the screen doesn't quite uh, catch Sawyer Road. Uh, but it is at the top of uh, your screen. It is a um, 69 lot, 93 unit subdivision. Um, we had made, uh, based on comments at, at the, uh, one of the last review, re set of review comments, a major change uh, based on Girl Palmer's, Randy Dutton's comments in regards to Preservation Way as being the predominant uh, entrance and not landlocked. So we made the, the major change was uh, this radius 
in this location here. Um, event, uh, originally, this came straight in and went this way, and we teed in. Uh, because most of the development is up in this uh, northern area, um, it was decided that we would continue this as the major route and tee landlocked into that. Uh, that was the major sort of uh, the alignment change for the uh, whole the subdivision. Um, some of the comments that were brought up, and we do have a meeting, uh, I believe, this Wednesday, Jamal, at uh, 11 o'clock with all staff. Uh, so we have already initiated that. Um, and as mentioned by Angela, we have met separately with um, sewer district, public works, fire department, police, uh, et cetera, on the layout, the access points, emergency access, um, as laid out uh, currently, and have individually um, received their, let's call it their blessing. There's a couple things that um, might have been shown on the plans in, far as in regards to those dead ends that were an error on my part. Um, they are correct as far as the lot layout, the actual access to the lot, and being able to meet the requirements of the town. Um, and those would be one um, at Camary Lane. I had uh, incorrectly shown the pavement going too far to the end. It actually ends uh, 80 feet from the center line of Cape Cod in here, uh, bungalow. Um, and then at the same, at the lower end, it, uh, it extends only 80 feet, the pavement. We're providing 15 feet of gravel beyond that for snow storage, as Public Works had uh, requested. Uh, but all of the driveway access to those lots that abut that dead end uh, meet the uh, requirements for setbacks of driveways onto those uh, parcels. Uh, the other uh, question that came up, or the other comment that came up, is at the end of landlocked. And yes, the access to lot three at this end was too close to the end, and we're already considering now um, potentially extending the end of that so that it addresses that comment that uh, was uh, brought, brought up in this last uh, round of uh, comments. If you go through the comments that were, um, the 25-foot the buffer just also very poorly defined on this plan, the tan shaded is the wetland, but if you see the distinct line around it, that is the 25 foot setback. Um, that is shown on the plans. Uh, we will define that better, but that is actually the uh, 25 foot setback around all of those wetlands that are 15,000 square feet or greater. So it is shown, not clearly, we understand that, and that will be uh, defined better. Um, Knowing that we, there were the, was the amount of detail uh, in the comments, I won't touch base on every single comment going down through there, but I just wanted to uh, indicate that yes, we have asked for those waivers, um, and I think that uh, it, based on discussions that we've had with town staff and with uh, other departments, uh, they were all in uh, agreement that they would be uh, receptive to those. Um, a lot of the comments also uh, indicate uh, that shown on the final subdivision plan, shown in the final submission. So we understand that while those add to the quantity of the comments tonight, a lot of them have been uh, indicated by staff that they would be uh, acceptable as part of the final plan submission or the next plan submission. Um, the Layout, just so everyone knows, the, uh, the wetlands on site, you can see how extensive they are. Our first rounds of layout, we had over 20,000 square feet of wetland impacts. We're now down to 3850, I believe, of wetland impacts. We've walked the site with DEP, um, and there are no streams on site. Uh, they have indicated that um, that with the current layout, there is uh, less than a permittable uh, wetland impact for permitting purposes. Um, these, the wetlands 
uh, delineation, wetlands report, any vernal pool reports have all been sent to Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. They've all de been determined and those letters are within your package as being insignificant vernal pools. Um, so we've stepped through uh, that process also. Um, there was a, a, a few comments on uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission, uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, uh, DEP. Those letters are in your package. They have been submitted. We do not have a pre-application for stormwater yet with DEP. Um, I expect it shortly. Um, uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife and um, uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission have been sent the plans um, and I am waiting for a response from them. So those are sort of things that I just wanted to be able to clarify that um, the letters are in there. We're waiting for a response uh, uh, back from them. The um, other items which I would uh, you know, consider the, the minor items is the crosswalks, um, stop bars, stop signs, um, all as part of the uh, next plan submission, the final plan submission. Those will be provided um, on the set of plans and uh, will be addressed there. There are other comments in regards to the depth of the pavement. Uh, the depth of the pavement was in, is in accordance with the town's ordinances. Um, it is a 9.5 millimeter pavement, uh, which a one inch um, uh, layer is adequate because it's only a 3 8 inch stone. But we will have that discussion with Public Works and with Angela to determine what um, the town is looking for. Uh, or what we can consider there. The big picture is the stormwater. Um, the, the, as I said, we've sent it in for a pre-application meeting with the DEP. The site has two outlet points, two drainage outlet points. One is located in here, going across Preservation Way and off-site. That takes the entire back portion about half of the front 11 acres. The rest of it, there's a crest roughly in here, and that goes across a 15-inch culvert that goes across Sawyer. Um, with this development, we originally came in and there was comments on it because I was looking at it as a linear project in DEP's eyes because I was looking at treating the road because the lots are being sold. Um, the town's ordinances are uh, different. You include all the lots and incorporate that. So what we have done is, and you can see shaded uh, on this, is back property lines of the lots are ending up being an underdrained uh, filtration swale that go into um, storm drain system that then uh, go into detention or bio uh, retention ponds in, in these locations. Uh, but it is all treated on site. And if you look at the narrative for the stormwater report, we are less um, than pre-development conditions in all storm events at both of the analysis points. Uh, and we are treating water quality for all the, uh, for all the lots and all the roads prior to discharge to any wetland or getting off site. Uh, it's, a, it's a big site. You're talking 29 acres, uh, a lot of lots on there, and, uh, but we have provided uh, with the proper stormwater quality treatment and quantity um, for this development. And I know that um, with our upcoming meeting with DEP, uh, that's going to be something that they will be uh, looking at in detail. The, um, would in current comments were brief, but sort of touched base on all those type of items that uh, um, they would be looking at that, but obviously the town is looking at that, but also we're relying on working with the DEP to uh, resolve, come up to an agreement on exactly what uh, treatment is best. I think we have done what we feel is best for all the lots uh, and the roads, um, but
but there will always be some comments from the town, from DEP, that we will address. Um, as you know, it's a flat site. Uh, it's a four foot elevation difference across the whole thing. Uh, very difficult to get the road in there uh, with a 1% grade. Half a percent grade would have been a lot nicer. But a 1% grade was uh, difficult, but we managed to get it all in there. Made all the storm drainage work, um, all the water treatment work. Um, I think that it was well conceived uh, for this project with the intensity of the design in the uh, back uh, portion of the site. Um, I know there's a lot of other uh, general questions, uh, but a lot of them, as I had indicated, were appeared to be please provided at the uh, next submission. Um, and some of the things might not have been seen in Appendix 13, Appendix 14, which were the letters to the uh, different uh, departments or the agencies. Those were actually in there. Um, we went through all of the sketch plan comments that were back in July 7th or so of last year, responded to those, and responded to all the interim comments from meetings that we've had with staff and with um, um, uh, with the fire department, with the public works, mm -hmm. with uh, David Hughes at the uh, sewer district. So I think that we've we've put a lot of effort into addressing all of those. Uh, it is a lot of information to digest, but I think that we have um, everything there, uh, whether it's clear which we will clear up some uh, things in there, uh, but I think that uh, in general, everything is, is ready there for uh, moving on. Um, with that, I'd like to be able to answer any questions that you have specific to either the comments that you've had just now, um, or I mean in the um, comments that were submitted to us last Friday, or anything that you have from the board tonight. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <clears throat> um, so, uh, board, I think um, I'd like to tackle this one kind of in a similar manner. Uh, let's let's start with some of the main elements here, and let's get some um, resolution on those. Um, sidewalk uh, a waiver for a sidewalk. Uh, there's two. My understanding is there's two should be sidewalk on each side of the road, and applicant is proposing one. I think staff is indicating that perhaps a uh, contribution to the multimodal account for the one that's not being built might might work. Um, wanted to know how uh, the planning board viewed that. <laughs> yeah, do you have... Um, yeah, do you have actually... Any specific comments regarding the reason why you're looking for just the mm -hmm. one sidewalk in there versus the two? I mean, from an engineering standpoint, it's uh, impervious area and water quality and, and water, <coughs> water quantity treatment. Uh, from the applicant's uh, viewpoint, um, Mark O'Leary is here, and I think I'd, he'd like to address that. Hello, Mark O'Leary, 35 Abbeville. Uh When we started out with this, it, to me, it looked like a, a sidewalk on one side was plenty for the size and scope of what we were doing. I understand the need for the sidewalks on Sawyer Road. Um, there were two components that you put into the comments. The, the fee that could be put into that fund, and you also mentioned the recreational fee, possibly going into that fund uh, towards the sidewalks. Um, If we needed to extend the sidewalk down Sawyer Road from where it was with uh, sawgrass down to where we start, uh, it's about 1,250 feet. I would hope with uh, the land that we're giving to the land trust that creates recreation that that would uh, benefit that fund in itself. Um, the other issue you asked, what we needed help with. 
I don't have an understanding of what you want for the uh, going east for the connectivity to Gorham Road. I have left a strip in there. You got your. I've left a strip in there right there, a 50 foot strip that actually comes over and goes like that. I retain that for that reason. Um, I certainly don't want to run a road six or 700 feet for something that may never happen. But that doesn't answer your sidewalk. Um, if we have to go outside and work on from sawgrass down to where we are, uh, I'm sure we can find a way. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take a jump at this one. Uh, you know, internally, um, you know, I see, I see a lot of lots. I see some, some smaller, smaller lots in residential area. And it tells me that you're probably going to have families moving in and going to be a nice little neighborhood and, um, you know, how much traffic is being generated versus, you know, versus kids at play. You know, that's what you always worry about. Do I believe that a single sidewalk can work in a development of this fashion? Yes, I do. Um, do I see staff's point that you're requesting a, a waiver of this and could some of that funds that you're not expending on a secondary sidewalk go into contributing to helping the kids that live in this neighborhood get around down into the area? I think that's not a bad solution. I mean, that's, that's where my, my head is on this one. I don't think you necessarily need the, the two internal, but I think that um, I think the, the money you're saving on the sidewalks it can benefit the town and the community a little differently. The conversation with, that I've had with residents of Sawyer Road, mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest <coughs> issue. Um, so if that needs to be the route we go, we go that way. Uh, the other thought was to, to only bring a main trunk in straight back and not put them along <coughs> here, uh, where there's limited number of uh, residents there. But I'm sure it's something that we can work through based on past conversations that we've had on that. Does anyone on the board want to jump in on this? I, th I think the applicant and staff need clarity. Yeah. So yeah. really as nicely as I'm trying to ask, I'm actually going to need you to answer. So <laughs> feel free at any moment. <laughs> So, so would you recommend a sidewalk or the money going into the interval? I think we could have, as Mr. O'Leary said, we have time to have a discussion. Or I think let's take a look at, you know, what's the linear foot. You know, I guess I don't know what the apples to apples comparison is. I'm not sure Mr. O'Leary does at this point either. So let's sort of take a look and figure out sort of what that is. Um, and, you know, if we can come back to this board with a reasonable solution or direction. But I think, you know, at this point, the board sort of indicates we want the two sidewalks or we're okay with just the one without any other consideration or find some type of solution, that's really the, what we'd be looking for, I think, tonight. Hold on, I have Jen that was. I, I just had a question um, for staff. Is the, is the sidewalk, the sidewalk material in any case, whether it be on both sides of these internal roads or on any side of Sawyer Road would be Bituminous, is that correct? They're proposing, they would propose bituminous in the subdivision, you mean? 
Yeah. On the, on the. Well, that's right. The or, was right yes. One yes. sidewalk. One sidewalk between this. Yeah. And that is what we would put <coughs> on Sawyer Road, right? Most likely. Most no. Likely. Okay. Yeah. Don't mean to put words. It's a question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, curb type. Along. Uh, we've been using concrete to perform. Okay. That's what we're proposing as well. Yeah. Okay. Just just checking. To, so, what I'm getting at is basically that you could uh, that we're not looking at like any different material that would cost more in one place, but a different material somewhere else that would cost more or less. Um, Other than internally, they'd have to account for it in stormwater as well, and yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think. Um, Jay put it pretty eloquently that the um, the larger public value is in connecting, really working towards full connection of both a facility that the that the town is investing in now on Gorham Road um, to an existing facility elsewhere on Sawyer Road. And whether this, you know, I don't, again, I don't know the linear footage if taking sidewalk out from both sides along these um, proposed roads would connect those dots or not. Probably not. It seems kind of far, but I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, I, I, but also, you know, young families having a couple of little wild ones myself, not having any sidewalk um, in a, you know, in a, in a neighborhood like this, um, would would freak me out. <laughs> um, so I think that's I think there's a compromise there. I my my preference would be for um, going with the waiver for only sidewalk on one side in the development, but with a contribution to connecting sidewalk infrastructure elsewhere on Sawyer Road. Thank you, Robin. I agree. That's exactly what I was going to say. We got to start. Here we go. Third, I agree. Okay. All right. Looks like we're all nodding our heads. So that's that's addressed. Uh, <clears throat> you did address the 25 foot buffer. We've got that under control. Um, that just needs some highlighting. Sacramento, the, the applicant extend landlock lane right of way to the easterly property line to enable potential future vehicular and pedestrian connection to Gorham Road. So I think staff I think, clarification here. I can jump in on that. I don't sure. think we're actually asking for them to build the road. I think it's preparing a right of way for a potential future connection. Right now, what you've got in that 50 foot strip, that's about 750 feet long. Um, it's bordered by wetlands. There is a trail that exists there right now. Um, I was gonna use it as one of the open spaces. If I need to change the, uh, and create an easement or whatever for you, that's, that's fine. I guess I'm confused where the strip is. I don't know if you can see, but there's a 50 foot strip there. And it's actually angled and comes over and goes this way. So it doesn't currently connect to the existing right of way, or to, uh, sorry, the proposed, the proposed right. <laughs> um, uh, it, what's that it, called, land, Land's End? Or uh, yeah, it does landlock. not connect to Landlock. landlock. Development scenarios come up that it makes sense to make a connection over to Gordon Road and through. So I think that's just the alignment we're looking, talking about. So, yeah, we, Understood. We appreciated that there was that other 50 foot strip there that, that, was, that was for. So I think we're really not too far off, but certainly some details need to be shouldn't that be Shouldn't that be lined up though? Like right now. If I understand you, if they don't line up. No, that's where the road stops. We're, we're going to propose to go 25 feet more. That gives us enough room for uh, a driveway. Um, the only other thing you could do is you could turn that road down here to connect with it. We've kept everything out of the wetlands. That's the whole thing. And how far over is, where's Gorham Road? How far over? Gorham Road is about 700 feet to 800 feet down here. Okay. It's 2,000 feet from right there. Okay. 
So it sounds to me like <clears throat> the easement can be easily resolved through discussion with staff. I'm sure we can come up with something on that. Wonderful. Uh, next is waivers. So I've got a list of waivers here. Uh, the 24 to 22 foot uh, public street width. Uh, I have staff here says they're generally comfortable. I am generally comfortable. How does the board feel? Yeah. See nodding heads. So that's that's good. Hammerhead design, uh, Angela, and you had you had a concern on the hammerhead, correct? Um, I did on the the dead end sections without hammerheads, and it sounds like Steve kind of clarified that there's a difference from what's on the plan as opposed to what might uh, be proposed. Okay. So yep. the left end typically public works wants them on the right. Um, we talked, and we are in agreement with the left hand one in this. So this sounds like a non-issue for staff. Uh, board is generally comfortable with that, I assume. Okay. I just want to circle back to something that you raised actually with one of our prior applicants, and you were asking, mm -hmm. asking about interconnectivity, and I referenced the future yeah. application. That's really what these two other uh, dead ends are about, and I think that you know the applicant going through the pre-application process, working with staff, has really worked with us pretty well to, to look for those future interconnections. And I think that's just where the confusion around the length of Dead End Road came from. Um, so uh, just for what it's worth. Thank you. If I could visit that for just a second. Sure. I had a conversation with uh, Mike Shaw back on the 17th, and he said he was okay with a 15 foot instead of a 25 foot. Um, length uh, before the. Are you talking, you're talking after driveways. Driveways. Correct. So I just wanted to clarify that because we had said 25. No, it's what he had told me is he was okay with 15. In those specific instances, or you're all, nope. I guess the comment in staff is also about landlock having that more of a multi-family or whatever it is uh, more use driveway on the end of landlock. And that's why we're looking at. Okay extending that 25 feet. Yep. Okay, then we'd have the same driveway, but we'd have the distance. So uh, that's that and that. And there is one more co uh, connectivity point, which is right there, um, that would go to the car property. And in your comments, you asked for a uh, temporary hammerhead where phase one is only going to here. And we're wondering if that, it's only 35 feet deep if that would suffice for a, hammer, a temporary hammerhead until we went to phase two. We can slide it a little bit more, but that's about what you're gonna get is the 35 feet. I think that'd probably be a good conversation to have at our meeting on Wednesday. Perfect. Can I just ask procedurally, was there a pre-application meeting at all with town staff or is this? There was. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, Nick? Yes. Uh, just to follow up on what Jay, Jay's comments, mm -hmm. I was just kind of curious, have you had any conversations with the Downs property about inter in, interconnecting at all? Uh, initially, and I've looked at their plans, and that's one of the reasons those roads are where they are. Yeah. Um, everybody understands that with the uh, zoning of this land right now, there cannot be connectivity. So zoning will have to change before you're gonna get that. We're not against it. It's, we've, we've set up for it. Uh, and I might just expound on that just because okay. currently the, the BR4 zoning essentially says that, um, what are the two zones? <laughs> I think it's the BR4 zoning says that you can't connect into a, another district unless it's only to serve other commercial developments. So it could connect into the downs if there was just sort of a dead end residential activity back there. Um, so it doesn't talk about full interconnectivity. So 
As the zoning currently exists, the roadway is unlikely to go through there. But it does provide the ability to access utilities, pedestrians, bikes. You know, there's no other prohibition. So I think, you know, Sawgrass is a subdivision that I think a few of you are around for, which had the same provisions, and we sort of extended this dead end uh, for that property to the downs, and you know, we're looking at sort of pedestrian connections there. As Mr. O'Leary said, who knows what the future may bring in terms of connections, but that's not a conversation, I just want to be sure we're clear, it's not a conversation that, um, you know, is necessarily being had about changing the zoning currently, but it does sort of at least preserve for the, who knows, uh, because right now it does, but it does in the short term also serve a very good purpose in terms of pedestrian connection, as I said, utility connections, those other types of elements. Because I, I think this is going to abut up to the core their core section. That's actually, uh, sort of we're retaining land down here, and it's actually beyond that. So we won't, uh, yes, the core, yes, not the uh, technology. Not the innovation, but the, yeah, the core. At the, at the bottom end of the innovation district. Okay. So if that, so in other words, if that core, because that core is going to be a mixture of, <laughs> and you're saying that, So I'm going to keep moving on. Uh, minimum distance between intersections uh, is 300 feet. It's, there are portions of Cape Cod and Camry Lane. Um, is center line to center line with 290 feet. So you're 10 feet off. Yes. Uh, anyone on the board have an issue with waving this 10 feet? So, she, yeah, so it looks like that's going to be okay. And then uh, sidewalks we just discussed. So outside of that, does anyone here have any qu questions or comments for the applicant? I've, I've tackled the bulk of what I think the applicant probably needs to hear tonight as well as staff. Um, anyone have anything else to add to it? I just have. Rachel does. Yes, Rachel. Yeah, I, I was looking at the, the section under the remaining elements in the open space. Um, but did I hear correctly that the open space next to lot 71 is actually going to be a stormwater basin or? Right there. That's correct. It's bioretention. Bio bioretention. Yes. So where is there going to be actually open space? Um, for a community to use, yeah. if I can uh, walk you a through park that. or a green or, w or whatever, where would that be? First one's going to be here, inside there. And what we're talking about is putting a fire pit and a gazebo or maybe something like they have out to two lights, uh, a covered uh, barbecue, something to that effect. Uh, we have two here, this angled, one there and one there. And what we're looking to do is one of those will be a senior, one of them will be a youth. Um, looking to put a small orchard, eight, ten trees, somewhere right in there, something a little bit different. Um, we are going to come off this hammerhead with a parking lot for egress <laughs> to uh, the land trust. And in that parking lot, I'd like to create a staging area for people, picnic tables or something like that. So obviously, there's recreation there. Um, where else am I missing? Didn't, didn't you also say you are going to do a transmission tower? No, gone, done, over. Gone? <laughs> We're going back to line, land, land lines? <laughs> I'm just not going to talk to people. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, this has all got trails through it, what we own. Um, and there's trails within uh, the land trust that those will all be connected. So. And for what it's worth, I'm not sure if it's been, maybe it's been mentioned, I've lost track of it, but the, the sort of connection to the land trust is, this is sort of the, uh, 
the Sawyer side of Warren Woods, which connects all the way up to Bain Road. <coughs> so um, this really connects quite a broad swath. And then, you know, as we've talked about the pedestrian connection, you're now able to get yourself down to the school campus. So on the side <coughs> I, I think your uh, your open space concept is is impressive, and and I think Thank it's going to be quite a quite an amenity for the the folks there. Uh, I I guess I, I did have one question: Are the, all of the buildings going to be modular? They are. Okay. At this point, um, we've looked into it extensively. One of the reasons I'm doing that, uh, I'm not looking for a development that's going to take seven years to build out, mm -hmm. stick built. I would rather bring them in. Um, they can turn one of these every 15 days. And uh, the company that we're working with is out of Canada, and I can tell you the product is impressive. Uh, the insulating factors in it are higher than what we do here. Um, yeah, but just be, before, you, before you go further, my daughter has a, a, one of the prestige houses, and it's a very nice, very nicely done. So I... Uh, Good selection there. Um, people will have their choice of the various offerings, or just to a small degree. I would. We would rather do the majority of this as spec houses. Um, from the price points we're trying to hit, I'm not worried about them selling. Uh, once again, I don't want. I don't want the people on Sawyer Road, or the people within this uh, subdivision, looking at construction for a great deal of time. Um, I think it's cleaner, it gets us in and gets us out, um, and it completely uh, brings the list of subs down so there isn't as many hands on this. Uh, two bedroom, three bedroom, is there a, a mix? What, 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 good, a mix, okay. Yep. You getting ready to move? <laughs> no, but <laughs> I said I, I um, the, the concept of what seems to be the small lots, the high amenities with the public space, uh, and good workforce family housing is something that we really are looking for and appreciate and appreciate your efforts in, in bringing it here. So thank I, you. I can't tell you how many people have already approached me on this um, and we're not marketing or doing anything, but it's with an approval it will go awful fast as long as the permits are ready. Uh, the rentals that we're doing, there are uh, 30 senior rentals in this and those are all going to be done in a duplex form format. Um, One of the prestige homes, they, they did have the duplexes? Yes. Okay. Yep. And are there any multi, larger complex, larger housing, or just the duplexes? The I would guess the duplexes <laughs> will go anywhere from uh, 900 to uh, 11, 1200 per side, um, plus an additional single car garage. The uh, single families, uh, really what I'm looking at is the 12 to 14. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that there's gonna be a percentage of people that are gonna wanna go up to 2,000 square feet. Um, we have made the impervious area on these lots relatively small. What was it, 1,500? 1,500 and that includes the garage. So, I mean, if, we're gonna, if they're gonna be larger, we've gotta go up. It's gotta be a two-story, mm -hmm. so. All right, thank you. I, I, I noticed in your packet you didn't have single family floor plans like you did with the duplex. Is that because you have multiple? I, I gave you one, and that was the, uh, the cottages. That will be one of the single family plans in there. Okay, I, I must have missed that. Okay. The, the only other comment I would have is on your, on your, and this is maybe just me, but. For instance, on your phased C100, it seems like you have everything upside down. We were hoping you wouldn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> that will be fixed. Okay. <laughs> so it's not just me. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> is there any other planning board comment at this point? Uh, there is an opportunity for public comment this evening. <laughs> Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this topic? We have a I'm phone close call. public comment. If I can take two more minutes and just hit a few more of the comments real quick for you. Sure. Um, we talked about the, the landscaping. I'm fine with the, the two trees per lot. Mm -hmm. 
some of these lots are relatively small. Some of them have 50 foot frontage. When you take a driveway and what you really need for water and utilities, I think we'd be better served to do one tree on those lots. Um, once again, we'll still use the same number of trees, but let's <coughs> use them in other areas within the development uh, so we can get the most out of them. Um, we're looking at some, uh, this area right here, the Wilsons live here. I want, we'll have a study done where we know where the light will hit their house. And I want to run arborvitaes um, with some ornate grasses in front of them so that they're not getting the, the street light, the car lights in there house. Do the same thing on the other side of the road uh, for this house right here so that they're not constantly seeing it. Uh, we didn't touch on the mailboxes. We're going to have a receptacle here. Once again, it will be behind those arborvitaes so that they're not looking at everybody getting their mail all day. And the other one we were going to do right in, uh, right here. Um, one of the comments addressed uh, potential drainage issue going out onto Sawyer Road. If you look at the curvature of the road, as well as the profile on that, we have two drains right here. There's no place for the water to go but down those drains. So, so, so basically you're saying the Postal Service is not going to be going throughout the... No, we'll get it set up so it's a drop here, which will encompass all of this, and then they may have to do two drops, uh, one here, and I think the other place we were looking at was right in front of um, the open space. one of the open spaces. Have you um, have you considered um, some sort of a, um, a small building or something to receive packages for the people who? Because a lot of a lot of people are getting deliveries now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that with some of these developments. Um, it's certainly something we can look at. Uh, I stayed away from it for the simple reason that when I was here before, I talked about putting some storage units here just because these are smaller houses. And I was told the board kind of felt like that was not a good idea. So I've stayed away from any other structure other than what I was doing in the wetland, in the uh, open space. But I can certainly look at that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, one last thing. Yes. You didn't have the uh, distances. There's over 460 feet of visibility this way, over 500 this way, and the closest driveway is, I want to say, 64 feet away. Um, so we certainly didn't see an issue with uh, the traffic end of it on that. So. Thank you very much right. for coming thank in. You. We'll see you, I assume, shortly. Yes. And We're coming right back at you. All right. We thank you. Have a great day. And, and thank you to the staff and the, uh, the department heads for all the guidance they've given us. All right. Next item on the agenda, Central Maine Power is tabled. Um, we're into staff report. I think I can start. Um, just continuing on with our new routine. We had three pre-construction meetings since the last... Uh, board meeting. The one started with the Hillcrest Community Center expansion, uh, the Next Gen Fitness Center, outdoor exercise area, and the main veterinary clinic expansion. They're all underway. That's what I have. Administrative amendment report. Uh, I was going to do nope. uh, one quick staff update just to let board members know and others from the public who may still be watching at this hour uh, that on June 20th we're having uh, the Route 1 study that we've been working on with our partners at PACS and friends from SACO. Uh, we'll be doing the, per the public presentation of the draft report on June 20th. That's next Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Wentworth School. So you should start to see notifications and announcements about that. I'd let this board know. Hopefully we'll see a few of you. If not, I'll be there. Thank you. Administrative amendment report. Uh, none this time. at this time. Okay. Correspondence. Planning board comments. Yes. So I apologize for not mentioning it in advance, but I went to um, this uh, Thursday of last week. I went to the Build Maine conference. I don't know if that's if any of you are familiar with that. 
Um, I went because my employer was a sponsor and all I could think about the whole time that I was there was how relevant it seemed to a lot of the conversations that we're having here. Don't tell my, don't tell my job. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a two-day event. It happens every year. It's in Lewiston and it's generally focused around development. They have an, this uncanny ability to bring in really tremendous speakers. Um, one of them this year, his name is Jeff Speck, and he was so good that I'm going to send out some links later this week to, um, uh, he's done a couple of TED Talks generally around walkability, but how that shapes development, and um, just a really dynamic speaker, and a lot of what he said is relevant to pretty much every project that we talked about tonight and, and others. Um, there was also an interesting uh, woman that gave a talk about historic preservation and she really got in depth into the difference between um, the historic register and the actual um, like uh, nationally preserved monuments and what that means. Um, she spoke at length about sustainable development and how really the most sustainable um, way to develop is to preserve what you have. Um, and that it's possible to um, preserve buildings in a way that are efficient and sort of on the cutting edge of a lot of other tech technologies without tearing them down and starting over. And so um, I thought that was really relevant when the Crossroads people were talking about um, the fate of their grandstand building. So anyway, I'll, um, I have this handout here if anyone's interested in reading the bios about the speakers, and I'm happy to forward on links to the presentations that were given those will be made um, public in the coming weeks but keep it keep it in mind maybe for next year i don't know if it's anything that scarborough is interested in sponsoring if a municipality is a sponsor of this event any of their municipal um, staff planning board council members or elected officials are entitled to go um, without having to register uh, to pay for the registration so I don't know how much it costs to sponsor, but <laughs> it was a good, it was a good thing. It's a great event. Thank you very much. Any other planning board comments? Yes, Robin. Um, I am brain dead, so, <laughs> but I did want to just <clears throat> let the board know that um, the long range planning uh, committee has been um, hearing from staff and staff has done a tremendous job harmonizing contract zoning reviews and amendments and I think we're going to see some really good things come of that uh, at the end of the summer. Um, I think Jay and Karen Martin have already made some really good progress um, and I think there's some other things coming out of long range planning but I'm brain dead so I'll just stop at that and say thank you to staff. Thank you. Any other planning board comments? Mm -hmm. All right. With well, that I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Show us adjourned. Thank you.